Okay. <clears throat> Welcome everybody. Um, good to see such a such a good turnout. I will call the meeting to order. I'll just say a few words about meeting logistics. Anyone who's appearing uh, remotely, we would ask you to uh, set your name to uh, to your actual name so we know who's uh, who's participating and who to call on. Um, anyone who who is addressing the council when you come to address the council, please state your name and where you live. We would ask everyone to keep your comments to under two minutes. Um, <clears throat> one of the anyone who wishes to speak must be addressed uh, called upon by the mayor. Once you be called up on, you can uh, <clears throat> again start start your comments. Uh, anyone who goes off track or uh, exceeds the time, and Councillor Bate will be keeping track of the time. Will uh, be gently reminded to uh, get back uh, on track. First item is to approve the agenda. Are there any comments or proposed changes on the agenda? Oh yes, and uh, Councillor Brown being remote, uh, would you please uh, introduce yourself? Yes, hi, Carrie Brown, uh, Councillor from District 3. Thank you. I had it in my mind to do it and that's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, now, anything we need to adjust about the agenda before we get going? Okay. Next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on the agenda. Again, we uh, ask you to limit your comments to two minutes. And I see we already have a speaker. Zach Hughes, uh, District 3, um, Prospect Street area. I uh, just wanted to say tonight, I want to welcome the new council members and welcome the mayor, congratulate, and uh, you know, let everyone know we'll continue to work together on the issues. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for running. Good to see everybody. Uh, Connor Casey, I'm your state representative from Montpelier. Really, Mr. Room, welcome to the new council members. Uh, I found it such a rewarding experience while serving for the five years here, and I hope you enjoy it as well. Um, just coming to comment on an item on the consent agenda, I asked um, the mayor to bring this to everybody's attention. It deals with the sale of 110 State Street, uh, which is the state's attorney and sheriff's building at the moment. Uh, I serve on the, uh, on the institutions committee at the state house, which deals with the capital construction bill, uh, which also deals with selling state buildings. 110 State Street uh, has been recommended by the governor to go up for sale. I think there's about 15 state employees working on it yet at the moment. So it's a very underutilized building. Uh, so that'll go for sale. What I did was I put language in there uh, to give Montpelier the right of first refusal to buy this property uh, if it's of interest. And uh, what I'm still a bit unclear on is how much parking comes with that. If you look, if you're standing on State Street, you know, you look at the MT Bank. And then right next to it is the state's attorney building. There's a wee strip of a uh, parking lot for the bank there. And then you have sort of a Taylor Street parking lot there, just uh, just across the street from the transit center. So, uh, you know, property in downtown Montpelier is pretty scarce, pretty precious. Uh, there would be no obligation for the city to purchase this. But the way the language is currently written is you would have a year after the passage of the capital bill to decide, which would be probably a year from like July. So. At that point, you could do whatever you want, you know, park it with Down Street, uh, see if there are other uses that might be appropriate for the building, but always better have options than not have op options. So with this, uh, the, the letter you'd be looking at is just coming from the entire council rather than just the mayor and city manager expressing interest in this. And I think it would be enough to get it over the finish line, at least on the house side. So that's it Thank for me. You. While you're here, does any, do any council members have any questions on this item? Okay, great. All right. Happy to come Thanks, back Connor. anytime, folks. Yeah, good to see you. Cheers. Okay, is there anybody else in the room who would like to be uh, recognized? Okay, I don't see anyone. Um, 
If you're participating online, please uh, activate your hands up signal electronically or raise your hand and I'll we'll keep an eye out for you. Well, again, not seeing anybody. So we will move to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Um, and I just really quickly apologize to everybody for adding some of the minutes that were already approved back on. They were just an ugly mess I and mean, they needed some work, so. Okay, we, I heard a suggestion that we, we take the meetings, take the minutes from before uh, March 8th off the consent agenda because we have uh, members who are on the council who uh, were not on the council at that time. So without objection, we will do that. Any other uh, suggestions on the consent, consent agenda or are we ready for a motion? Okay, um, Carrie Brown, I'll recognize you. And then Peter, I do see you have your hand up. So Carrie, are you are you muted? Sorry, I'm yes, I was muted. Uh, sorry. Um, I had asked for some additional information about the recreation center feasibility study, which um which city staff provided, which was very helpful to me. But um I still would like to request that it come off the consent agenda just so it has a chance to we don't necessarily need to have a big discussion about it, but just so it, it has a chance to be heard on its own. Okay, great. And with that, is somebody ready to move the consent agenda? With those changes, yes, uh, oh, Peter. Yes, I'll I will recognize you once we have a motion in a second. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Peter Kelman, you're recognized. Peter Kelman, uh, Mountain View Street in Montpelier. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing to what Carrie asked to do, which I would have asked to do, which is if it could be discussed either in conjunction with or after we hear the uh, report from uh, uh, White and Burke, because it's related. The rec center study? Yeah. That's fine, yeah. Go ahead. Why don't we discuss that when we get to that later? Okay. Because I'm not sure it's completely, it's partially. Okay. With, okay, are you ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Next, we will, uh, uh, the chair would uh, <clears throat> accept a motion to uh, approve the January and February minutes. So moved. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Can I just ask really quickly that folks who make motions and second really do so in the mic since I'm not there. We had to do a little, I think that sounded like, uh, I think that, but it'd be probably a good idea to be clear. I'm writing them down for you too. Oh, thanks. Okay. Now, <clears throat> recreation center study. Bill, do you want to take, sure. kick that off? I'll take a stab at this and um, Kelly, maybe will jump in as well. So. Certainly understand why it would seem connected to the the Elks Club uh, Country Club Road project, but actually it's really about identifying the rec needs. It's completing the study that we'd started pre-pandemic. So it's basically saying if we were to have a new rec facility, what are the desired uh, elements? What are the things that should be there, regardless of where it is? So while it certainly could be relevant at the end of the day to the siting, because you say, hey, we need one this big or this big or whatever, that might inform a decision. But it is not designed to say, we want this facility at this location. So I just wanna make that distinction. The council can wait for the presentation. It really doesn't matter. I just wanna make sure people understand that this study is not about a rec center in one specific location. It's about rec center needs and community wants and those kind of things. Is there anything I'm missing? Okay. Okay, Council, what's your pleasure? I would like us to advance the study as in, the intention was. So I'd make the motion to, to approve, approve mm -hmm. moving forward with the study. Is there a second? 
I'll second it for conversation. Okay. Okay. With, with that, I, I read it. Um, I guess I'm not used to having as many consultant studies coming at me in a week as I've seen in the last week or so. <laughs> um, it's it's okay. I'm just not sure another fifteen thousand dollars is worthwhile. Are we really going to learn any more from this consultant than what we have here and what we already know about Montpelier? I mean, my first reaction was okay, but not another increment of it. I support it is we've heard that people feel things are out of date and, and they feel like the world is different after the pandemic. Yeah. I don't think that's necessarily true about what we want for the rec department, but it was part of our goal was to make sure we had current information. And this was done in 2018, ended in 2019. So. Carrie. Yeah, so part of my, my concern about it was the um, the description of the, the scope of services, which is kind of a, a list of bullet points. And I wasn't around for the beginning of this, you know, back in 2018, 2019, whatever it was. So um, it didn't really make a lot of sense to me. So I'm not I'm not opposed to this, I don't think, but I, I would love some more clarity about what they're actually going to do so that we do learn something beyond what the surveys already told us. Um, so I don't know if that's something that we can get, or if we can, if we can just say we would, we're we're okay with going ahead with this, but we would like a follow up with some actual, you know, narrative description of what they're going to do and a list of deliverables would be great. So within um, the proposal um, that they're we're, we're putting forward for the fourteen thousand five hundred, um, what that would be doing is giving us a um, pro forma study and analysis of um, costs and revenues for programmatic items. So it would be looking at um, the current site, uh, looking at demographics, looking at um, what's what's needed within the community, and then determining. You know some cost estimates and modeling. Um, this has been done in other communities, um, such as South Burlington and the city of Claremont. Um, so if you do have some case studies, it would provide us with additional detail in terms of being able to get the modeling for a community center should we move forward so that we'll know what um, revenue would be generated. Um, right now, we might not have access to that kind of information without doing this study. I will also say that um, this would be sort of the next step in the process that was initiated in 2018-19. Um, the total of that contract um, was 39,500, I believe. Um, and we spent about $20,000 there. So doing this now would add on an additional about, you know, uh, $4,500 um, of the total contract cost to do this additional work. Um, and so, I do think we would get additional information out of it um, in order to help inform the process. Um, I think it also would come from, you know, a subject matter consultant um, in the area that would help us really kind of gauge where we're at and where we're going um, so that you'd have those details uh, to make some decisions. Um, would this uh, include an analysis of uh, revenue and expense for something like an indoor pool? Um, so the initial planning did include or would include that. And in this particular instance, I don't know that we would be including that. It's something we could. Oh, I'm just thinking in, in light of what we're about to see on the um, White and Burke presentation, it, if, if it doesn't include that, I would suggest that we, we ask that it, that it could be if within the um, within the contract terms. Yeah, um, they will be looking at current um, recreation facilities and then evaluating you know need. So yeah, I mean I think the revenue information might be enlightening. Uh, you know there are ways to generate revenue with with an expensive thing like an indoor pool. So sure, thank you. Sure. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I I think this makes sense to do, especially with. Just remembering the analysis that was done a few years ago, it was so predicated on the constraints that each of those sites had. So now having this whole new site, it kind of makes 
some of that analysis is still useful, but a little obsolete in terms of like what our options are. And I did get a lot of feedback from constituents uh, who participated in the process that we'll hear about later around um, the country club site who were really like wanting this bigger picture of well, what are our options at all the different sites. Um, so I think, I think it'll be helpful to get this more updated uh, picture, not just the analysis, um, but like just knowing that that analysis from before really just focused on the kind of like narrow opportunities we had in our current rec building and the pool site. So um, I think it's it's worthwhile. Thanks. Oh, Carrie. Yeah, so I have two questions. One is, um, <clears throat> Kelly, if you were able to, or Bill, um, able to just kind of sum up like in a sentence what the what the question is that this is all this whole process is trying to answer because really specifically and then my second question is about <clears throat> why are we not why would we not be talking about an indoor pool because that was one of the primary things that people said they wanted in the survey and it was a, a point of so much focus then i'm wondering what has changed Sure. Um, so I think in a sentence, you know, this um, study would do two things. It would really evaluate current recreation of facilities against future needs and assessments, as well as looking at um, programs within that facility and determining sort of that need. And then lastly, would be looking at those programs within that facility to determine what we could anticipate in the form of revenue generation. Um, and also they would provide us with cost estimates for doing this um, capital investment. So there's a couple of different things. There's the, you know, evaluation of the current site. Uh, there's the programmatic evaluation, and then there's the cost modeling. So there's kind of the three pronged um, deliverable here, I think, with this study. And that's not a short sentence. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have anything to add, Bill? And the pool. Oh, yes, of course. Um, and so, you know, certainly we we could include um, the pool in the evaluation. I think um, we didn't necessarily put it sort of front and center just based on, you know, past feedback that we have received from the process. But this is also part of the reason why we're doing this, because, you know, this is this is new. Yeah, so. Carrie, one of the things uh, about the last time we did this study was that the the idea of doing an indoor pool was a very popular idea. And then the next question was taking for taking this as the price tag of an indoor pool. Now, do you want to do an indoor pool? And the support went way down. So I don't know what the um, <clears throat> what the voters of Montpelier would ultimately are ultimately going to decide to do, but that's uh, that it was a very strong indication that uh, the the price was discouraging people from uh, from wanting to go forward with that and and were people clear that they were happy to pay some some additional amount of money for something else in particular not a pool i'm not sure what, what people are going to be willing to pay for but but the price so that that seems like part of what this study could be doing is is fight, figuring out well how much would it actually cost to have a pool and what would the impact of that be financially as well as uh on the quality of life in the city oh i agree and i think that that's something that we could that could easily be incorporated into this because it's already in the, in the baseline of what uh, what they've looked at before tim did you have your hand up Okay, um, anyone else on the council have any further comments to make? I see at least one hand from the public. Okay, we'll go to the public, uh, Peter Kelman. Um, I don't mean to be argumentative, but this is why I thought these two things should be uh, discussed together. Uh, Kelly immediately talked about the, the present uh, facility and everybody else has been bringing up things that are related to uh, the uh, Country Club Road. I, I, I think, these need to be planned together. It would be a waste of money to tell this uh, consultant to go off and not be talking to White and Burke uh, as they are doing their study of, of the Country Club Road. Um, there's too much siloing that goes on with consultants. Um, I've seen this uh, in, in other cases as well. So I would strongly urge that the RFP or whatever it is with this group 
the direct them to uh, be in communication with White and Burke so that these two things are done in parallel and maybe even time it so that they're done more in parallel. That's why I had asked that these be these conversations be uh, combined. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. May I? Yeah. Um, Peter, thanks for your comments. You know, I, I think, um, you know, our intention here is to make sure that this um, item does help inform the process. Um, but I think that this item also needs to happen regardless of what happens at Country Club Road, because we currently don't have this information. And so this will help inform sort of, you know, future state for a community service center. Um, and so I, I do think that Sure, there is definitely a correlation um, with uh, the Country Club Road property and that site. Um, and I think that this will be very helpful um, with that project. But I also think that, um, you know, if it were to stand alone, it also is something that we need to do to kind of start to move the needle on um, the community uh, services building. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um... Councilor, are you ready for the vote? The motion is to approve the uh, recreation center study. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, we'll do a roll call. <laughs> Bate? Brown? Aye. I'm sorry, uh, Sal Alfano? Aye. Uh, Heaney? Cone? Uh, Harrell? And we've adopted the motion. Thank you. I it just a reminder again, if you could please speak into the microphone, because I didn't catch that. So I'm hoping, Bill, you did. Thanks. All eyes, but he. Okay. Thanks. Moving on to the next item, the country club. Just for those watching and for our new council members, um, we try to educate as we go along. When somebody participates, um, remotely, even just one person. If there's a split vote, the law requires we do a roll call vote. So uh, if it's unanimous, that's fine. But no, even if it's obvious who did it or not, but that's the reason the mayor called for that there. Thanks for reminding me. Yep. Okay. I, I do think we should take uh, John's comment about not hearing. If he can't hear, that means other people can't hear. So you really, these mics are hard. You gotta put them in your, in your face. Okay, next up, Country Club Road Report. The senior heaties, not the senior heaties. Oh, I'm really blind. And then it's just that worked super okay um i don't know how to test if everyone can hear me remotely too but um just want to yeah make sure to following Councillor Bates' comment to make sure my mic is nice and close. Um, hopefully, folks can see this. Uh, I'm going to try to 
I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, there we go. Okay. Hello, counselors and everyone out on Zoom and in the room. Um, I am Stephanie Clark with White & Burke. I am the lead on the consultant team hired to help with the Cons Country Club Road site master planning process. I am joined on the consultant team by uh, BHB and Black River Design. We do have one member of that team, Mike Vitti, here as well. And Josh Jerome from Planning is here, as well as Evelyn Prim and Kelly Murphy and Mike Miller, who are all on the planning team within the city. So tonight's purpose of our meeting is to update you and offer um, a bit of a reminder of where we are in the process, and especially for the new counselors, although we were able to do um, some education, and I know folks have been very clued in and staying on top of this, which is great. We are also going to share the results from our winter stage of the process here, the public component, mm -hmm. and we're going to really focus, what I'd like to focus on and get opinions on is the direction for the spring stage and this final surge of the phase one process to get feedback today. So let me see if I can just advance these slides easily. Okay. So again, this is the process. We've been um, on this timeline since the fall when our team was engaged. The property was bought in the spring of last year and there was community input at that time. And then our team was brought on in early September and we initiated a fall community input process where we had several multiple public meetings as well as um, some stakeholder meetings and at the same time did due diligence on the site and analysis. In the last stage of this that many of you attended and were um, engaged with, we did an opportunities and constraints process of looking at the test, <laughs> testing the limits of the site and exploring what the underlying conditions could accommodate, as well as prioritizing the different uses that are that were voiced from the community in the fall. So we have data on that now. And we are heading into the last stage, which is the concept planning stage. And the ultimate goal here is to bring back a concept, one concept plan. The phase one will culminate when one concept plan and an actionable master plan document that will entail all the findings we've had. It will encompass recommendations for next steps, and it will start to put um, some real parameters on what, what, the, what the site will look like. And between now and then, we are planning to do another round of public feedback, and that will look like it did in the winter. So several public meetings, lots of um, marketing. We have a, a thank goodness for Evelyn <laughs> as communications coordinator for the city, who is spearheading this marketing push to get the message out to do the outreach. And we've solicited opinions and help from lots of different pockets of the city to help us optimize that plan. And we know we've learned lessons in the winter that are going to inform our actions in the spring so that we can amplify the word, get people engaged, get people educated on this. We're going to do another survey and get the data in through multiple various means and bring that back to city council. So the next time we see you will be in May to um, give you the feedback from the community. And then it's ultimately this city council's decision on what plan to advance. And we'll get into a little bit of what that's going to look like in a little bit. So to, hi to, hi to recap the winter stage, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. Um, we had three meetings, variety of methods of, you know, in-person, hybrid, and online. 145 people attended and engaged in that process, which was wonderful. There was also a high school st student survey that a high school student led, giving us some great data as well to work with. And with the community-wide survey, which many of you mm -hmm. took yourselves, and that um, was reached a lot of folks. We'll get into that in a moment. But it yielded 12,000 data points. So it gave us a lot of information to work with and a lot of direction, which is exactly what we were hoping for. Qualitatively, um, I can highlight some of the ways that, some of the things we heard, which was, over overreaching consensus was to have both housing and recreation on this site, a balance of both. 
what a balance looks like is the question. Um, I'm not going to read every single one of these points, but you know, in general, very, very strong belief in mixing price points and product available for folks to buy, rent, live together, the importance of the integration of the site together with not just different price points of housing, but also the recreation pieces to get all of that integrated, not bubbled and uh, isolated. Um, there was a big response to make sure this is a connected site with the rest of the city transportation being a big key piece of that, transit, public transit being a key piece of that, and to be thinking of this holistically within the context of the surrounding areas as well. We also heard a mixed reaction about, and this actually speaks to Councillor Hurl's um, actual point just a moment ago about the the response from folks about where the community center or recreation center should be located. So there was not clear consensus across the board on every single part of this site, shocking, and uh, continues to be why I'm involved. Um, but you know, it really does emphasize that there are pieces that are very clear and there are pieces that are not so clear. We, we also heard, I just have to mention that commercial that was a pretty universally responded to, not a big interest in having big scale commercial out here, small scale, if any, out here. We have um, consolidated this feedback. You in your council packets and on the website have a document that, that summarizes this qualitative data, but we also then had the survey, which is what we're gonna go through now a little bit, some of those responses. And that those results are gonna be on the website tomorrow. We have now finally been able to export all of the data from the Polco survey. We also have, and there are some hard copies here in the audience, in the room today for the audience, and there's also the high school survey responses as well that we have on, that will go on the website tomorrow on this Country, Country Club Road site webpage. So folks can see the raw data for themselves if they're at all interested. We are, um, but I will go through now a little bit about the, the, the findings of the survey. Just a reminder, this was the site test sketch called test, test C, which was a balanced approach between mix of housing and recreation. So I just do this as a refresher. This is not the concept plans we're going forward with, but this was um, the one that got much more um, favorable response from the, from the community. So our survey reached a good number of folks. Um, you can see the percentages that are listed here, and I'm going to scroll up because I know it's not, it's cutting off, truncating my, my screen a little, but these are the results we got. And in green, those highlighted <laughs> bars are what are represent the majority of, per the census, of, of the majority um, residents of Montpelier. So consistent with that, you know, we got 38 response, 38% 38 response from this income level, and that is actually the majority of uh, Montpelier residents according to the survey data. So that's what this slide represents. Um, what I want to point out here is that we did receive an overwhelming response from folks who own their own home, but that is not representative of the split according to the census. It's more like almost 50-50. And so that really says to us that we didn't do a good enough job in outreach to renters. We did a last surge and kept it open for an additional couple of weeks when we found a couple new resources and avenues to pursue, but we will do a better job with the spring phase. And so we admit that that's a shortcoming, but we're hopeful we can reach more with the next, the next survey and we'll provide that data in the next round. So here's just some of the quick findings. Um, as you know, you can you have seen in your packets, and people might have seen at home, when we asked the question about which uses um, they support, the overwhelming response was for outdoor rec and housing, but childcare and indoor rec were not far behind. Then, similarly, asking the question, "How would you lay out the site?" You can see it's a pretty strong preference for a balanced approach between both. But again, nothing that was so clear that we would have produced one of the test sketches to bring back to you and say, done. You know, so here we go, We're, we continue on. This gets into some of what we were just talking about, what the council was talking about moment, moments ago, 
maybe I can do a little bit better on my scaling here since I'm new to this a little bit, but um, sorry. So the uses for a rec center, the question was, what features are your household most interested in? And the top features that came back were childcare and indoor pool and gymnasium space. And so I know that that somewhat dovetails with what Kelly was just talking about. Um, but what's interesting to us too, is that when we surveyed the high school students, there was a similar response. So similarly prioritizing a pool and outdoor rec, bike trails, dog park, but also gymnasium, things that would require gymnasium space. It was a similar question. It wasn't asked in the exact same way, but similar results. The high school survey also yielded some interesting um, findings around conservation, some strong feelings around conserving some of the property, and uh, it kind of spanned about how much should be conserved. Some said half, some said more than half, some said exactly half. So um, that tracks also with what we found in the, the community-wide survey and, ha and heard in the meetings. Um, oh, sorry, let me just comment that in the high school survey as well, um, we heard that transportation was a key concern for high school students. And uh, we know the four main ways they, they said they mostly commute is vehicular, walking, biking and public transit. So that says to us, those have to be well accommodated at this site. That just has to be an important piece of what we consider. Um, unsurprisingly, but just an important data point is that half responded to the survey saying, about half say that they would not stay in Vermont, that they don't plan to stay in Vermont. And this tracks with the statewide average that we um, are familiar with. And I think that most people know, but it really underscores the need for quality of life investments and projects like this one, which have been consistently ranked as an important part of wanting to stay in Vermont and wanting to stay local and the amenities, both recreationally and professionally, that something of this scale could provide. Another survey response was around building height. Uh, we heard mostly all the majority were for three stories or higher um, building height and what we take from that, and I add here a note about kind of my, our professional opinion, my professional opinion here is that the efficient, it will matter very much how that is done and how the three stories to five stories or beyond is shown. And because we're planning that this would not be developed, the housing would not be developed by the city, this would be done by a private developer. That's something that we want to emphasize in the RFP process. And one of the things that was so important to the community was sustainability, sustainable design, um, energy efficiency. And sometimes those are accomplished with going vertically. Um, another important uh, priority of, this, of the community was open space. So that also complements going high, higher, not wider. So we wanna make that, strike that balance in the RFP when you go out to a developer to allow flexibility to be able to accommodate all the goals we're trying to do here. So, yeah. This point, you're you're back to the non high school survey, right? Correct. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Mayor. That was a that was a an overall community wide survey finding and um, community meeting survey takeaway. Um, back to the main the the community wide survey and the meeting data. This buildable area. This is just a refresher of the buildable areas that were shown during that winter phase stage and that were shown as the um, for the test sketches and that's relevant because this chart here shows us a lot and i'm sorry it's a little hard to read if you're reading it for the first time but essentially what's bolded in the green cells and with the red highlights are the dominant most most major you know most popular within each category so across the columns go by buildable area a b a through f and the natural areas east and west, and then down the rows are the different uses. And the way this, this is a limited, as all survey data has to be taken into consideration and the questions we ask have to have, to have some context, this has some limitations because the question we asked was what use would you most want to see on each of these buildable areas? So the, the top line takeaway is that there was a strong 
desire for multifamily and outdoor rec in many of the different zones, the areas, trails on multiple of the areas. Um, east, west, very clearly conserve land and trails. But some of the other uses, we just have to note methodol the methodology of this, which is that maybe they were ranked lower, but that may be because they did not want to have an entire buildable area dedicated to a community garden, for example. That's a lot of space for a community garden. So we don't want to discount something that says 0% as, as off the table. It would be maybe in conjunction with these other uses as you put that together um, with dedicated abnecky space or conserve land or multifamily in a combination. So that's just an important um, data point. And also solar arrays, I do think we made a mistake a little bit in our terminology. Sometimes people hear solar array and think it's a rooftop solar array. Others think dedicated solar field. We were intending it to be solar field here as if it was going to take up an entire buildable area, but some folks probably were very, you know, intent and we heard it qualitatively over and over in the survey comment section, as well as in the meetings, that energy efficiency and sustainable design was of a top priority. So we just take that into, you have to take all of that into account when you look at data like this. And a lot of that will be taken into account by the developers themselves and by the city developing any kind of recreational building. That will be on us. So what did we take away from this and what is known? Um, what we know that can be put into a concept plan for this phase one is that it needs to encompass housing and recreation, that there needs to be both on the site that there need to be a mixed a mix of housing product, whether that's different styles and different layouts, as well as um, putting different, uh, depending on where it is on the site and not just siloing it. We know that the two natural areas on the east and west are more than likely going to be trails and conserved land. And that trails and open space need to be incorporated throughout the entire design. The general road location is also pretty well known. That came out less from the community process, but more from the consultant team and the design team looking at the natural resources, looking at the topography and the characteristics of the site itself. Some things that we know now are also things that we know will not be incorporated at this site um, in phase one in particular. Um, for example, we know that there are um, specific developer decisions that won't be made in phase one. So things that were suggested that are really creative and innovative that we will capture in our findings, um, geothermal uh, technologies, the co-housing model for housing, those are all great ideas and we wanna make sure those are surfaced and, and put out maybe in the RFP process as mm -hmm. ideas that are important to the community or were of interest to the community, but aren't gonna be things we're gonna be proposing to be codified in that phase one concept plan. There are also ideas that were thrown out that we did some due diligence on that we know won't be accommodated at this site. For example, some um, there was a few people talking about schools locating here. And when speaking with the school district, it was not of interest or um, they not interested in engaging on that conversation at this time for this site. So we're not gonna be taking that forward and advancing that. If that conversation had gone differently, we would have been coming back here tonight asking what council wants to do. And then other ideas for phase two, there's other ideas that were really better suited for a phase two exploration. And that's back to this idea that was kind of just um, highlighted earlier and that we'll get into next about specific programming elements like a swimming pool versus a, ten a tennis court. That's gonna happen in phase two. So wouldn't be expected on this concept plan. So what do we not know <laughs> and what we might not know until future phases and what might be might come out as part of this phase one the next spring stage. The recreational programming is the biggest, um, is one of the biggest pieces and as well as the specific housing product. So again, just not to hammer this home, but again, the this is gonna go out to an RFP, a developer is going to need to bring forward what exact kind of housing product makes sense because this could be three years off or four years off and that may change. So we're not gonna predict that. What we are gonna do is show illustrative 
intentionality of what the city would like to see in the buildable areas for some of the housing product. And that will serve as a, as a guide, especially in building the RFP and talking about affirmatively what we are looking for, but the, that will not ultimately be what's likely designed, the layout, the exact cost of those individual units. We will not have that information. I just want to be clear. We're not going to be able to set the housing prices in the spring of 2023. And we're not going to know exactly what city infrastructure is needed for every part of the site, but we are going to get to a little, an order of magnitude that I'll get to in a moment. The other piece is the recreational programming. Um, at this stage, we don't know exactly what indoor space and what outdoor fields are needed. There is, it is an iterative process and the city is working, our team is working and the city is working with the rec department and working on more data. The Ballard and King study is gonna provide some additional helpful data and there needs to be a more, um, there needs to be more public process around that. The concept phase one concept plan will not be showing mm -hmm. things or fields. Um, we will be making recommendations likely for a focus group, a working group, and a process for answering those questions as we go forward in phase two. Um, but where that zone of indoor rec and fields will be located is part of this phase. So where that, we're calling it the recreation and community zone, which you'll see shortly, um, where that's located is part of this phase and how that will be determined will come out as this um, in this spring stage. The other pieces, um, we don't know, like I said before, we don't know how necessarily each kind of innovation could be incorporated or all the different creative financing mechanisms. And we're, I, we need to be explicit that we don't know exactly how childcare will be um, accommodated here, but we can um, talk about that within the community and recreation zone. So within the concept plan, and within the concept alternatives that you that we're going to show to the public and engage with the public on and come back to you with over the next few months is they're going to incorporate it's going to incorporate a recreation and community zone it's going to incorporate housing options outdoor rec including a connection to the bike path um, show some options for how to accommodate dedicated abnaki space community gardens and additional trails, conserved area, open space, and also the U32 trail, as was uh, this has come evolved in the last few months. So to kind of get to that more specifically, let's see, I want to make sure this is going to get as big as it can for the purposes of our. And the font is very hard, much harder to read on here than it was it is on my computer. That is challenging. So I will read it to you, don't worry. So here's what we plan, propose to, to get to an actionable master plan. We're gonna be bringing back different concept plans, three concept plans to the community. And we know, things that we know are, I'm gonna use my mouse because I think I can, um, these natural areas, east and west, the green boxes right here say trails and conserved land. Sorry, it's too hard to read on this screen. Um, we will also be showing the U32 trail, as I just said, it's not shown on this graphic, but we will be showing that on the concept plan and a possible bike path connection, also showing possible vehicular connections to abutting properties. So very similar to how you saw the concept, the test sketches with all those elements that will be shown in this next stage as well. But you'll also be seeing a combination of different elements in all of the buildable areas. And so let me walk you through what each of these says. Number one, this is the recreation and community zone. Number two over here says multifamily housing or recreation fields. Three and four have the same two sets of options, multifamily housing or a combination of outdoor rec, trails, dedicated Abnaki space and community garden. And buildable area five has three options, single family housing slash tiny homes or multifamily housing, or that combination we spoke about, outdoor rec, trails, Abnaki space, and community gardens. So what we show here, and I have some questions, this is where we're gonna to get to the questions for council. The recreation and community zone, it, as I said, the final concept is not gonna show any programming, buildable buildings and fields in that se section yet, because that needs to go through a separate process. 
But what we are showing is the area. And we've shown this, it ranges, and you'll see, because I've got two different orientations of this, it ranges from about 12 to 15 acres. And that's been right-sized to preserve flexibility based on input from the recreation department, based on the designers, um, on the consultant team, knowing what, how much acreage it takes to accommodate that kind of uh, facility, those kinds of facilities. But it also reflects what was shown on test sketch C, what was the balanced approach. So it doesn't show the max max rec. It could be oriented differently. <laughs> and we, I will show you that in two slides because I want to get council's opinion on if you want to show it in two different orientations or if you feel strongly about one orientation. The design team felt pretty comfortable with this orientation, that rec would be the first thing you'd get to when you drive into the site, in part because if you had housing down here, for example, you're sending a lot of cars by a bunch of housing in order to get to the recreation when they're, that's going to be a major driver and, and vehicular draw. Um, but that being said, there's a lot to be said for doing a more horizontal type orientation that could accommodate fields um, on this flatter space and have more multifamily housing as a, as a entrance to the site. So I'm going to circle back to that question for you in a moment, but I want to go to my other two questions too, so that we can, uh, these are the three questions I have for you tonight that are going to guide how we put the concepts together for the next stage with the public. So the first question is around this location and size of recreation and community zone. The other is around a a commitment to doing Abnaki recognition on this site. There was community support. It came out in multiple meetings in multiple ways to have this much acreage at the city's um, control to be able to honor the history here. What's important is that this is the capital of the state and actually represents, based on our meetings that we had um, with some members of the Abenaki community, Montpelier represents more than just another town because it also represents a history of diplomacy and also a history, a complicated history um, with the indigenous people of Vermont. So this does provide an opportunity here to do some partnership with Abnaki um, recognition, whether that's a trail, whether that's a specific space that's dedicated and devoted to the community to use, the Abnaki community to use for anything that they want to um, do for programming. It could be space within the community center. So there's lots of different ways it could go. We've met now with them um, one time. This will be a much bigger process. It needs to follow um, a bigger process where council and maybe a working group can get together um, with representatives and members of the community from different areas because there's no one spokesperson for this. And so to be able to do that, that may start in the next few months, but would absolutely be one of our recommendations if it's the city council's commitment to want to do something on this site. Um, that would be one of our recommendations for phase two is to engage with the community and stakeholders to be able to um, find the best way that's going to benefit everybody. And the last question I have for you is if there were any uses that I just rattled off, since you can't read them on that screen, sorry, um, if there were any that you opposed that you would not like to be presented to the community as options, because this is a city council decision. Um, if, for example, you thought, I never want to see single family housing on this property ever, and that was the consensus of the city council, we wouldn't show it to the public for the next three months. It's just not a good idea. So that's those are some of the questions to you. I'm going to start with the the recreation and community zone question. Oh, I think I went too fast. Here we go. So you saw that first orientation where recreation and community zone spanned this area, but you could also do it more centered here in the middle and do either multifamily housing um, or other type of fields here at the entrance. So the question being, does the city council feel strongly about showing two different alternatives um, or do you have a preference for one or the other? And the last thing I'll say before I actually ask for input is that the concept plans are going to end up becoming, they're going to be a little bit of cobbling together because we have multiple choices for multiple zones. So it's kind of like a build your own adventure, choose your own adventure um, buffet and how exactly we're going to get the input from the public is still 
something we're working on. Um, one idea was to just show one big plan and have each buildable area with a couple different concepts on one plan. And the idea of how big that graphic would be, and if I'm having this many issues with this, this graphic here, I don't actually think that's a good idea. So I think it'll end up being three concepts, but for each buildable area, there may be multiple combinations that could be done. And so ultimately, I don't think you're going to get the, the public coming back to you saying, I vote one, I vote two, I vote three. It's probably going to be a, a, a way of building this more um, iteratively, I guess. So one versus two, the two different orientations, kind of vertical or horizontal for the recreation community zone could be shown on a couple of different concepts, or it could just all three concepts show one orientation. And that's my question. And then those other two questions. So I don't know how, Mayor, you want to open that up to the council's discussion, but that was the best I could do. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Stephanie. This is this is a lot. <laughs> Tell me about yeah. it. <laughs> good yeah Go great information i think this is uh, very helpful and and so council members i see uh carrie you already have your hand up so just talking about that first question uh carrie go Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I'm I'm sorry, but I need to back up a little bit and get some clarity on what um, as we're talking about, you know, how to arrange things and, and what it might end up looking like. What what is the authority that the city has to be able to make those determinations? Is it through zoning? Is it through? Are we gonna? Are we intending that we'll come up with a clear plan that says only this kind of housing and only this kind of rec recreation will happen in these certain places? Do we have the power to do that? Um, I guess I just want to know a little bit about the mechanics of what would happen next as we're talking with developers and as we're trying to make something actually happen on that side, given that we're not likely to be the ones as the city to build all the housing and everything here. Yeah. So I, that's what I'm. A good question. That is a very good question, especially um, if you have that question. I'm sure the new counselors definitely have that question. Um, I think, and I'll speak to this from my where I'm coming from in terms of my assumptions on how we're going to build the actual master plan. And then Josh or Mike could jump in on planning zoning. Um, specifically, the this is concept planning, master planning at its highest level, really. So what this will do is set out the goal and part of phase two recommendations are going to include things like what kind of zoning would need to be changed and what kind of designations you might need or um, changes to the master plan are going to be needed to meet these goals. So for example, to have housing out in buildable areas three, four, five, the zoning will have to change for that. And we know that already. So this is the master planning that needs to occur before you do any kind of zoning changes because what if the consensus was three, four, five should all be recreation, in which case the zoning would look very different. So again, this is the precursor to that step. And then in turn, you asked the question around the developer part of it. Um, there is a point at which the city stops having control. And that is where I was making the point, you can't design the pods of housing. We can't do that ourselves. But what we can do is show a vision and show illustrative vision for what we want here and a list to go with it of the types of things that are important to us and then see what comes back. And at that time, there's gonna be a whole nother process in place to have the council and the community de deliberate about which kind of proposal comes in and what makes most sense at the time. Yeah. Respond to that. So I think Stephanie got the bulk of it right on. I think just stepping back even further, you know, I mean, the ultimate authority is we are the property owner. And so we can sort of decide this is where and how we want to use the property as it lays out. And we have the ability to change the zoning. And, you know, we won't be able to 100% control the housing, but we can ask for what we want. And we can figure out, we can see what proposals we get and, and the proposals that are most close to the desired outcomes are the ones we have the control over who we select. So there is, you know, some control or reject if they, you know, so they come back and it's not at all what we want, then, you know, we're back to the drawing board. So, so we have those kind of controls. We can't, you know, like you said, we're not going to build 
the housing ourselves, but we can guide it. That's for sure. And we can figure out what kind of investments we want to make, whether it's in the infrastructure or other things that will help maybe make the project more affordable for the end purchasers. So those are the kind of policy decisions the city can have as it goes forward. Yes, Berlin. Um, it is very visual, so great for me. Uh, I just want to check, maybe we don't know the answer yet. Mm -hmm. Will there be any um, expense difference yeah. if we choose the like first plan or this right. plan? Because as far as I understood, we cannot do anything about the housing as a, a city, yeah. but we will build recreation, right? right. That's so... Right. Which one is, yeah. let me say, um, less expensive. Right. right? Cost more. Sure. So um, it had this micro decision to make if I should continue with the presentation and then take questions and, and get input. And there's one more slide that I think is important. So I'm going to do my last slide now before we continue, because I think it, it addresses your, your point. Um, what we'll be doing out of this is to create these concept alternatives, but one of the pieces will also be the order of magnitude cost estimates. And not just cost estimates, pure numbers, uh, but also the implications. There's permit implications. There's other implications that can basically be translated in every person's mind to a different cost. So we have kind of an idea of a matrix that we'll put together that will show, you know, green, red for certain types of things, certain types of um, implications per design alternative. And so I think um, at that, in this spring stage, that will absolutely need to be part of it. And you had made the point before that was really astute that um, if you have, uh, yeah, if you, if you really had to make, and it kind of ties into something that um, Councillor Bates said earlier, it's like, you'd be willing to pay up to a certain amount for something, but may not be willing to pay for it. If it's, you know, if we're running infrastructure out really, really far, that's going to cost more, um, doing roads and doing, um, water and sewer out to the fifth buildable area. It may cost more, but it may cost less than doing the max, you know, possible recreation you might do because you're also putting money back on the tax roll by putting, making that property privately owned. So there are some different trade-offs. So yes, as part of this next stage, we will associate costs with the choices so that people can make those with some context. And then we're also going to be doing outreach. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear as part of the next steps. Yeah, thank you. But I think you ask us to choose one of the plans so it will go to public. That's why I was asking how we will oh, decide not, which yeah. like a recreation center here or like the yeah. others, how we can, dis or at I least see. I can tell my, for myself how I can decide the cost Which difference is, between yeah. these two orientations. Yeah. Yeah. And no, the there one. won't be. So, I don't think there's a sizable, I don't think there's going to be a sizable difference between the two of those in terms of cost difference there. Uh, we're talking about the same land area. Um, maybe there's a top topographic difference that could cause some additional infrastructure costs, but you're going to be running infrastructure up through these. So I don't think it's a sizable enough difference to have affect a council decision at this point what goes in those sections absolutely will have enough of a sizable difference. So you need to know that for the next phase, next stage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, um, so it sounded like you, when you present whatever you're, whatever we decide or suggest that you present mm -hmm. to the public, there will be some costs attached in, in their decision-making. So if we, if we come up with, a notion of two options to show the public for input, they'll have, they'll have costs attached to them. Right. Yeah. We are going to, we are going to present three different concept plans okay. and that's a, that's a given. Um, the different combinations that are in that is a little bit to be determined by the design team, but the decision tonight is whether or not all three incorporate one of these orientations or if they, if, if we should diversify between the three a different, you know, offering two different orientations of that community zone. And for those, we don't have a cost differential right now. But when you, when we show the costs, I expect we're not going to have a concept one costs a hundred dollars, co option two costs 200 or 300. It's going to be by buildable area. 
most likely because we're going to be showing different uses within each buildable area. So we'll break it out a little bit more rather than try to give one because people will probably end up doing wanting to cobble it together differently. So in addition to, to that kind of information, uh, I, I'm assuming there'll be other kind of annotations, pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, For exactly. Example, the implications. The, the, yeah. What you mentioned about traffic passing mm -hmm. by. Some people might think mm -hmm. of that when they're looking at a plan and some people might sure. not think of that. Exactly. And permitting feasibility, um, different types of impact that could happen. That's the kind of implications we want to show that won't be quantitative, um, but will be flagging pros, cons, or, you know, um, one is stronger or not, not as strong in some of these. I was also struck uh, by one of the earlier charts very early on where people wanted to do everything everywhere all at the same time. Um, and I, I wonder if, um, yeah, was it, wasn't that a movie? Uh, I wonder if, if people are, um, and maybe you can incorporate this into the phase two mm -hmm. input phase, but I wonder if people uh, are aware really of the topography of the property. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you stand right. in the parking lot, right. it looks like a flat spot with some hills. But if you walk it, yeah, I mean, you, you find get a workout. Out that area yeah. four is really two halves. You know, right. the top half is right. much steeper than the bottom half. Totally. Um, so I wonder if people's um, input mm -hmm. will be better, a little more nuanced, if if we arrange for a tour or a couple of tours mm -hmm. of the property. It'll be nice weather. It'll be better like, than you know, the winter. Yeah. Of this year. So yeah. just just a thought. Yep. Um, Yep. We, yeah, that's not a bad, that's a good idea because we, you know, we did the, we've been doing on-site meetings with each of these stages, but do an on-site in the first one, we did actually do a, a site tour, a site walk. So it would be probably wise to do that again, now that we'll be hosting these in April, May. Um, and it might be tolerably not muddy. We'll see. <laughs> and, um, and that that's a good point. And we can point out some of that. But again, I think in that kind of matrix we're envisioning, we're showing the strengths and weaknesses of each in, of each decision, you know, if you put housing up on the ridge, you've got implications of, um, you know, visibility and sight, but you also have the advantage of, you know, nicer views for some folks and you have nicer, um, you know, it can, can nestle into the hill more. So it's not standing out first thing when you drive on the site. And really your point about that slide is that not everybody's going to be happy. And my, I'm just praying somebody's happy. Like that's really the yeah, thing I, I'm going you know, into my, this. My content, so sort of, my, my comments sort of tipped my hand. I mean, I, I think the, the more options we can give people for input, the, the better off we'll be. I mean, the last thing we want to hear is when we're halfway through the project, you know, you didn't tell us that, you know, right. so right. Uh, I think with the kind of information mm -hmm. that you're talking about, sort of cost, uh, mm -hmm. pro, con list, some sort of narrative that explains the ups and downs of, of one mm -hmm. or two or, or the three options mm -hmm. that uh, we'll get we'll get better results and maybe even more more results. Um, from, yeah, it's interesting. The yeah, the options, like multiple options versus also quality of data. So yeah, yeah. we're giving we're trying to winnow the options in some ways because, you know, we can't have everything on the table this entire time, but at the same time, upping the quality and upping the information that goes with each of the options um, as some have been eliminated, but the ones that have stayed, now we have more data and now we have more um, robust context. Yeah. Yeah, Tim. Yeah. yeah. To see how this is even since the other day, since yeah. it's an update. You probably need to be on the microphone. Even more Am I? Time. Okay. So a couple of questions and thoughts. Um, and I think in terms of citizens being able to make nuanced decisions, I still think the key piece um, that isn't in the mix yet that needs to be is, and, and hopefully in the next phase will be, because I think there's an engineering firm that's part of your team, is some engineering data about this project, because there will be tipping points. And these tipping points represent large amounts of money that will impact the feasibility of different options. Um, and that's not being discussed at all. Um, we're in kind of a dreamy phase right now, which is nice, but without knowing the cost to actually get utilities, roads, um, if a secondary road is gonna need to be created to connect back through, um, you gently mentioned it in your report, but if that has to happen, you're talking millions of dollars. That's, that's not a, a couple hundred thousand dollar little add-on. And that will impact 
-hmm. how far you go with this project. So I think I really want to see more engineering data help people make these nuanced decisions and not just keep going with what would you like to see here. Um, I'm feeling like we're bringing people down a path that we may end up pulling the rug and I, that's not good. And I do like the idea of keeping lots of options available. So like the phase one piece, having some housing on the lower end to help pay for some of those utility costs going up may make a lot of sense. Um, may not be the answer right now, but I think we should preserve options like that because I really don't have a problem living in a place where if the rec center's up the street, some cars are going by my house. Other people might not like that, but on Main Street. So. Uh, <laughs> um, so I think really, I guess my point for the moment is let's start looking at costs to get those water lines up there. I noticed in the new water report we just got, there's one little line in there about just getting the line to Country Club Road, I think it was 285000 I assume that's the bottom of the hill um, to get it up the hill under the railroad tracks and up to where we're going to start building rec facilities and homes. The, the numbers will be significant. You've also got sewer lines. Um, all the sewage in that part of town is on a pump station, I believe, that comes back through. Uh, will that station handle it or do we, need, do we need a new bigger pump station? If so, let's know that. Um, does the intersection have to be rebuilt? Will Country Club Road actually handle X units? Um, or does it need a substantial rebuild and redesign? Uh, you've got a railroad track crossing. Uh, it's, it's just a lot of factors, which is true of any project. It's not unique to this one, but we need to know some of those answers to guide us in how we proceed. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, how, how much engineering do we have? Do we, I mean, it's not a big hill of sand, right? I mean, there's rock right. and- Right, do we, we do know? have due diligence. We do have a natural resources assessment and we have the preliminary traffic assessment, transportation traffic, traffic assessment. To Tim's point, yeah, you could parse what you said. Basically, you know, we have some preliminary base data and that is what has informed this initial concept, conceptual um, road alignment and positioning of these buildable areas and so forth. So it's kind of laid the groundwork, but to his point, taking that, you know, now it's step two, which is now we need to assign costs to some of these, some of these pieces. And once we're clearer on, you know, is this going to be, um, you know, now that we're at this point where we know it's not all going to be recreational fields, for example, that gives us the green light to go ahead and start pricing out, okay, how would it, how would it cost, what would it cost, and how is it feasible to get the water and sewer up to zone three, four, five, for example. So it is the next step, and um, we have the baseline to do that. So, so your, your report to us mentions uh, inclusion of the city's infrastructure mm -hmm. components. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about. You, you're going to uh, yep. try to forecast Correct. what those costs might be for water, sewer, for power, mm -hmm. uh, roads, bridges, everything that- And specifically entailed. looking at the differential between multiple concepts, not necessarily, so to your point, you know, there's a, there may be a tipping point of units. So if we were looking at costs, let's say with uh, concept, those test sketches we looked at with ABC, where you talked max housing, which could be 500 units or something versus 200 units. Um, what we'd look at is the differential between those two in terms of the city cost, because it's going to cost something to get water to the site. But then is it going to also take an additional, how much more to provide that much more water, an additional pump station, et cetera, for the purposes of additional, you know, 200 or 300 units more. So uh, what we'll be looking for is the differential between the options and highlighting those costs. Donna. I'm glad for all those practical things. Like cost is coming next in reality. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to your two pictures here, mm -hmm. this one and the one before. Right. This Which one. is one of your questions, right? It is, yes. And yep. I like the one before because I feel the housing should have at least a potential future of sort of gathering together rather being sort of isolated on the other side of the center mm -hmm. building. So that's the one that I prefer to start with as a rough draft. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's helpful if the council narrows it down to three or four choices. I, I, I just don't, we've had it open wide and it's now time to start narrowing it. Correct. So that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. your big, sorry, big picture vision of this mm -hmm. thing in terms of process. Mm -hmm. So we'll need an Act 250 permit at some mm -hmm. point, right? 
Yep. And so once we have that, we really need to have a pretty solid format for what we want to see because you don't want to keep going back and revising and changing Act 250 permits. It's another that's right. costly adventure that's, right. that's not real fun. Yeah. Um, so do you see it being maybe like five pods where you'd approve 100 homes here and whatever, but have like sections that we could then parcel off to a phase. developer? Yeah, developer a, phase, a phase okay. Act 250 approval. Um, and probably the next step in phase two is actually going to be preliminary conversations with state agencies before we even get to an Act 250 level, because okay. we need to clear some hurdles around primary ag soils and wetland impacts um, if the desire that this is why we couldn't do it during this state phase, but if the desire is to put multifamily housing in multiple of those spaces versus mm -hmm. open space and conserve Great. land. Yeah. Great. This is related, I guess, to the, ne the next phase. Um, I, I worked a lot with blueprints many, many years ago, building homes and things. And um, very few of my clients could imagine a, a three-dimensional object from a two-dimensional drawing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, an issue we have here. Yeah. And I just wonder if you're equipped to um, produce a model, maybe not a physical model, but a three-dimensional model of things like a five-story yeah. building versus a three-story building. I think, I think there's a difference between those two buildings yeah. and, and the context yeah. is different too. Yep. Yeah in a flat site, a building plopped down in the middle of nowhere is very different from a, an even taller building right. tucked away somewhere. So is there a way that you can, in this next phase, give we people a three-dimensional idea? <laughs> so we actually did it in our last stage. In the winter stage, there were um, two different site corridor, uh, well, there was the, the site view shed corridor, and then there was the um, site scale um, graphics that we presented to the public and to council at the time, which was um, showing how if you did a cross section across the entire site because of the topography of the site, you know, it is hard to see it in plan view. And so rather, if you were to take a cross section of the site and stand over in the natural east area and look, and you had a five story building over at the top of the site on the right on the north side, um, it does just kind of fill in with those trees. And so we did do something just like that. And I think we could update it to some degree for, for some of the concepts we're talking about. Um, budget being what it is for yeah. this phase, I'm not, we're not going to be able to do too much representation, visualization, um, not to say that that couldn't be or shouldn't be part of a phase two to really il illustrate some of that. Um, well, I, I know you did. I know you did it. And I, yeah. I like those cross sections yeah. very much and I understood yeah. them, but, yeah. but I doubt that any of my previous clients would have. Yeah, yeah, it is. They it's need, a part of the they challenge. need three dimensional right. objects, I right. think. Good point, Seth. Very. Thanks. Um, so, is the question before us right now about the two different choices of these two different mm -hmm. drawings that you've shown us? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, don't I have to show them side by side, but these are okay, the two. great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so, I agree with Donna. Um, I like the one that has the recreation as the first thing that you get to when you drive in and clusters all the housing together. Lauren, do you have anything to ask or add? Um, I, I'm also, I like the idea of the housing being clustered. Um, I mean, it doesn't sound like there's a strong difference price-wise or anything that we're hearing. So, I mean, to me that, you know, keeping the people together seems like a good community building. So that seems good. Um, yeah, I guess just on the broader conversation, I mean, the, the piece of like, as we get to the costs, being able to understand like opportunities, I mean, you're talking about phasing, which I think could be a important way to actually implement development on this site. Um, but like, I guess being able to understand, you know, does it make sense to maximize the water sewer infrastructure now a big upfront cost, even if we don't develop all the housing now, or like, what are, what are our options going to be for different price points that would give us the opportunity knowing there's so few buildable sites that the city like has control over. So like creating maximum opportunity, but looking at kind of the, the pros and cons and cost spectrum that that would create, just, I hope we're going to get that kind of information to. 
be able to see our options for different phasing over time. Yeah, I think that one of the things we're seeing here, um, and is is that you came here with, with to us saying, I want the answer to this small question, and people have gone to. There are all these big questions right. that we really need to address before we know the before we even know what the small questions are to answer. So sure. uh, you're doing the answering of the small questions, and I knew you'd give me more questions to answer. So that was it. I didn't even uh, I didn't put that on a slide. No, <laughs> that is exactly the kind of direction though that we need. And I knew we'd get some. You know, as you ask the questions, that's going to inform this next stage. So. Um, not hearing anything else from members of the council i see there are some there's at least one member of the community and possibly more who want to be heard uh peter kelman uh yeah thanks uh peter kelman uh on mountain view um a, 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 a number of people uh Saub in particular have talked about ways to make sure that ordinary people can actually make intelligent uh Opinions, and I just like I like to sharpen it in a couple of, of of ways. One is it's very as you as you learn from your two your your, your um, surveys you did before, the way you ask a question matters. Uh, people they say, you say solar arrays, and people assume one or the other. So I would suggest you do some beta testing on your questions. Try them out with some people before you you go public. And there are two areas you you've mentioned this, but it's really important. You you need to talk about net costs, not the up not just the upfront costs. For, and for example, I, I don't want to argue with Jack, but the question about the about the swimming pool, of course, the swimming pool is a big a big uh, cost. But I know, for example, the Claremont Aquatic Center has brought in a tremendous amount of revenue. I'm not, I'm not advocating for a swimming pool, but I just want to say that you need to make sure that people understand the net cost of something, which you've made that point about uh, 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 taxes, of uh, uh, you know, uh, grand list. The, the second thing besides uh, uh, net cost is when you talk about outdoor or indoor uh, recreation, I think you need to give examples. There's a big difference between skiing in the winter and tennis courts, uh, uh, outdoor tennis courts. There's a big difference between um, uh, an indoor gymnasium and an indoor, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, model golf. So I, 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 I think that, you, that some the more examples you can give and not just these large categories. And there are other things like that. So I'm just suggesting that you beta test your questions before you go public. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else online who's looking to be recognized. I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay. Uh, you, I will get to you, Caroline. Okay, we'll go into the room. Uh, Caroline Gruditsky. Step right up. Would you start by yes, introducing I'm yourself? Gruditsky and I live in Montpelier. And my only comment is just, I don't know what naturalists have looked at it but the fact that the natural areas are all fragmented and i don't see like any quarters linking them and i would think that's a very important part if people want open space and natural areas to make sure they're not fragmented i appreciate that because we that is one thing we affirmatively want to um show on the next in the concept plans and i didn't get to mention that so Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Steve, are you seeking to be recognized? I'd like to read my notes. Um, I want to commend or ditto uh, Councilman Haney's concerns about the cost of infrastructure. I raised the concern about the intersection, the stopping the, the level the VTRANS requirements for a certain size level zone before entering a state highway that can't be met with that railroad. And the VTRANS is not going to give up that railroad spur. So we may have an enormous cost based on the amount of traffic that we're hoping to accommodate in this site uh, that we should have known before we bought the property. Um, I have a question about who owns the 3D modeling. 
we ran into that with the garage fiasco where they claimed and the city mismanager supported the architects in claiming they owned the 3D models that we paid them to create. And that's absurd. And I just couldn't afford to litigate it. But you should get in front of that now. If we're building 3D models to visualize this site, the city needs to own those as public records. Um, the idea of having all the single family traffic pass by the multifamily seems just strikes me gut level is really classist, um, both from a noise, which has a health effect, and the pollution of the vehicles has a health effect. Um, I think if you're going to do site visits in the spring, you should stake out these numbered zones ahead of time uh, so that they're clearly visualizable from where certain zones would start and stop. Um, I think when you're talking about market rate housing, you're talking subsidized housing, how those impact the, the grand list value and the taxable revenue from this project. Uh, I fear that this could get uh, go as sideways as most of the other projects have gone uh, under this manager's jurisdiction. Um, I think we should explore with Downstreet the issue of the societal impacts, the challenges of mixing folks of different uh, cultures and backgrounds and experience and societal norms. We've had, you know, graduate degree people having to move out of the transit center because there's child abusers yelling and abusing their kids right next door. And it's just, it's atrocious. And the way people manage their garbage and the way people just, I don't have a solution to that. And I'm not trying to be classist, but that's very real when you start talking about packing a bunch of publicly funded uh, mixed housing into these types of areas. So um, the rec center costs needs, can, we cannot make intelligent informed decisions about the recreational use here without finishing the downtown master plan and whether or not we're gonna have a rec center in town. Uh, it's there's still, a, still just at three minutes now. Well, do you wanna hear the comments or no? Well, we have a we have a standard for uh, for comments, and uh, well, it, uh, you break it whenever you feel like it. Are you per, you know singling me out to narrow? I'm asking you to wrap up. I'm asking you to resign. Any other members of the public who would like to be uh, heard? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Nat Winthrop. I'm uh, vice chair of the hub, but I'm not uh, here tonight in that capacity. I'm a 40 year resident and uh, I have sort of a question comment about racket sports. That's a, I'm a tennis player and I have a lot of friends who are tennis or pickleball players. And as you probably know, we used to have four indoor tennis courts in Berlin, and now we have one. Um, and I did not see a lot of emphasis during the public hearings or in the survey uh, about racket sports. And uh, on a more micro level, and this concerns the rec department study that's coming up. So I guess it's a question for you, Kelly, uh, as to if there is a, a building up there with say two basketball courts. Um, my understanding is that still wouldn't be long enough, big enough for to accommodate tennis courts. It would be for pickleball. So anyway, I just hope that uh, the possibility of including indoor tennis uh, would be part of that study and the costs entailed in that. Um, on a more general level, and I'll be brief, uh, Stephanie, I thought that was a really clear and comprehensive report. Thank you. And uh, one thing that I didn't hear emphasized that I heard at a number of the public hearings was the emphasis on 
creating sort of a community vibe up there, uh, neighborhood. Uh, I know one of the premises is this is going to be extension of the downtown and not a separate community. However, there was quite a bit of uh, feedback during the public hearings that I attended on uh, this community feel. And one, that's one of the reasons people preferred the uh, hybrid model. Um, but the one suggestion was uh, retail, you know, a mom and pop type store there, which I didn't hear mention of in the, in the report tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Nat. A anybody else in the room who uh, would like to be heard? Okay. Um, so Stephanie, I think there you are on question number one, the, to the extent that you're looking for an answer, I think, you, I think you have some guidance. Question number two is the commitment to the Abenaki recognition site. Essentially a yay or a nay, essentially a yay or a nay on um, how it was, you know, shown here. We've got, again, if you can see this, uh, it says as a as an option for the public to respond to Abnaki space and get a feel from the community about where um, they would like to see it. And that's not the final word, <laughs> because again, that would need to be a conversation. But if this council was not interested in accommodating that on this site, we didn't want to present it to the public. So that's the question. Council members, this might be an easier question to answer. Uh, thumbs up, some thumbs down in general. There you go. <laughs> and uh, any uses in the buildable areas that you oppose that you didn't want shown as an option for the community if there was something that really struck you as not syncing with the goals of the city i i haven't heard anything that you suggested that i would say no way man we're not we're not having that uh, little grocery store there or or we're not having single family houses or <laughs> It truly was a question about single family housing because we heard there were some people who really did want that here. And so we think it should be a part of the conversation and as an option, but not, a, but that's not universal. Donna. I prefer not to see single family housing. But you still want to see it put to the community. Uh, yes. For this stage. And then, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Uh -uh. I noticed that something that I thought was in the survey and in the presentation, but live presentations that I didn't see in the results, and that was townhomes, yeah, uh, which are essentially attached single family. Yeah, houses. Um, are they? Yeah, it's we would put that under the bucket of multifamily because okay. it is not a single okay. family. But you're you totally caught us on that because there was a nomenclature spacing so issue. So they'll, they'll be they'll be represented. Yeah. yeah, triplexes or duplexes or townhomes. That's kind of part of the conversation. We do need to get our nomenclature right and and maybe it requires a little more defining um to peter's point we did beta test the questions <laughs> i pointed out some of our weaknesses i didn't point out our strengths some of the questions were excellent and uh <laughs> so we did what we could but we it's totally true there's going to be gaps but we'll continue to test them and uh some of that may be defining the terms a little bit better so right, thanks. duly noted anything else from council before we uh take comments from the public Peter Kelman. Uh, Stephanie, the, what is the meaning of the slash between single family and a uh, 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 tiny house? Because are you saying that that's what you mean by single family? I mean, again, this is a definitional thing. When you say single family, I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, that's a big split level or, you know, what, what, did, what did you mean there? Yeah, I don't know. No, I'm just saying I, I'm not I'm not 100%. Um, the graphic for tonight is really representative and more of a placeholder for what's coming next. And we will, you're right. I mean, you, you point out, we have to get a little more defined on it. Um, I think when we talk about options, when we look at presenting a few different options, how are we going to represent single family or tiny homes? Do we do single family on one concept plan and tiny homes on a different one? Or do you show them both? on one concept plan and then another one's showing multifamily housing. 
So those are some decisions for the design team to make at this point. Um, but we kind of put those in the buckets for tonight's purposes, just to get the general feedback and direction from council. Thanks. Uh, Josh, is there anything from the department planning department that, that you think we should be talking about that we haven't talked about yet? Um, it's okay I, to just say no. Yeah, I, I don't think so. <laughs> We do all the speaking, so yeah, no, you heard yeah. it all. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to put you on the spot, but I didn't want to overlook your concerns either. So, Stephanie, where are we now? I'm satisfied. I have my answers. We will be going forward back to the design team to create these concepts, and you can expect public meetings at the end of April, beginning of May, um, and we'll have those, and then we'll be back to you in we want to attempt to attend your second meeting in May for a final decision on concept planning and a presentation of the actionable master plan in June. Great. I won't be here. Like very likely I will have a newborn. So I'm just warning you that you may get another design team member at that point. Um, but that's the next step. And you will see marketing going out. Those concept plans we hope to launch middle of April on the website and do lots of promotion at that time in advance of those public meetings, because the public meetings are only one way to engage with this. The other way is to view the materials online and engage with the survey. One thing that I was thinking about as you were talking about, or as we were talking about the topography, is that uh, it would be potentially cool to have someone go out there and do a video on the site with the video camera. So they're walking around on the site or driving an ATV on the site or whatever. So people who watch the video can see, well, I'm going over hills here. I'm going down a dip I'm going, this is a flat area and you know, get that spread around. That could be a, a very good thing. Anybody have a golf cart? <laughs> I bet Go we pro. Can... I see it. Right, yeah. Uh, Thanks Donna. Yeah, uh, good point. Uh, That's what Josh is for. Carrie, thanks. Um, so a, a few questions were brought up tonight about um, costs and about infrastructure and things like getting water and sewer up there and and road development that kind of thing. And can you just refresh me? Is that the kind of thing that you are going to be addressing at some point down the road? Um, and as well, are you going to be looking at um, sort of how we might, once we decide on what we, what our vision is for it, how we might, what it, what opportunities there might be to work with developers or to find funding or to actually, you know, get this development to happen. Is that, are, are either of those within your scope of work that you anticipate? Yeah, Councillor Brown, that's a really good question. I had a note here from when someone made a comment about the cost implications and, um, or the net costs and thinking specifically around, um, it, at this stage, we can't be exhaustive. So, you know, it may not include every source of funding you could find for this infrastructure at some point, because we don't know when it will be built and we don't know when that, um, what, what will be available at the time. But what we're going to attempt to do is to try to show, like we said, net cost of where some of the um, income could come, you know, come from, or but that's more operating costs or look at um, capital expenses and how to bring those down. Um, that is part of this next stage. So April timeframe to have order of magnitude, not dialed in <laughs> just so no one gets, but it will help in terms of, I think the most important piece is looking at um, one versus the other and trying to make this an apples to apples comparison between the options. And we know we can't predict in 2023 what's going to be built in 25, 27, 29, and those costs are probably going to go up. So we're not putting a price tag on these affirmatively, but talking about comparison-wise, you can see the differences. And I think um, where we can't dial in some of the numbers, what we can do is talk about you know low, medium, high. You know certain th certain aspects just may not be able to be quantified because we don't have the um, the, 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 the known use yet, exactly the known placement of things. Um, so we'll do our best and we're going to come back with those implications and, and try to show apples to apples amongst the three in terms of net cost and net implications or strengths, weaknesses, however you want to frame that. Uh, Bill. Yeah, actually, that was my question. I was going to just make sure we talked about what to expect on costs. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Stephanie. Another great presentation. Um, I'll, I just want to 
remind all the members of the public if you had comments or questions or thoughts that you did not uh, think to ask, ask tonight or you, you want to add to anything you had to say, you can send your uh, emails to, you're saying Josh. to Josh. <laughs> yeah, that's his, his information is right on the website. J, J Jerome at Montpelier-VT.org and uh, anything that he gets will be, uh, will be shared with the, uh, with the council and uh, will become public. Thanks. Thank you uh, very Stephanie. much. We'll see you. Um, knowing, knowing that our next item is also likely to uh, take a fair amount of time, I think I'm going to say we can take our break now and uh, come back at about uh, 822. Okay, we can uh, call the meeting back to order. Next up on the item, on the agenda, it is the homelessness report from Parker Advisors. Um, do you have any set up or anything we need to start just out quickly, with? I can give a quick setup before they start. I just remind the council and public of how we, we got here. Uh, a few years back, a couple years back, we set up the homelessness task force and they have proceeded to look at issues of homelessness in and around the community. And uh, one of the projects they did was a sort of root causes of homelessness that was done by Beth Burgess and that, and that set up kind of here's what's going on in our community. And then the, in and around the same time, the city council set aside a sizable sum of $425,000 of ARPA funds to go toward something undefined, but to deal with the unhoused community. So at that time, the homelessness task force asked, uh, developed an RFP, hmm. or professional assistance that they wanted. It was the council, the council approved it, went out to proposals. Parker Advisors were a selected bidder, and they've been working really closely with the Homelessness Task Force over this time, uh, meeting with them regularly, updating them, have talked to a lot of stakeholders, and uh, the original report was due to be delivered in February, and I think we collectively decided that it made more sense to do it in March with the, the new council, and I refused to let them do it at the last meeting because that was going to be me talking for two hours, and so... Um, and so they're here tonight. And uh, I know the homelessness task force looked at it last week. I don't know if you met again today. No, no, some talk, no. So, uh, and uh, we as staff are still reviewing it and looking at it, but I think we're all looking forward to hearing the, the presentation and um, seeing where we go from here. And so what are you expecting as the outcome of the, well, this um, presentation? I, I would leave it to them as well, but I think, I think most importantly, hear the presentation for you to ask whatever questions and offer whatever comments and feedback you get. I know we as staff would like the opportunity to um, offer you some, some thoughtful feedback. I think nothing negative, but just we, you know, they raised a lot of good questions and clarifications and those kind of things so that we can have, but I, I would, I would hope this is the beginning of a, of a good conversation about where we go, but I think that's partly of what you all will tell us too, is this something, you know, where, where do you want to take this? So I think we're, we're at a, you know, a, a crossroads of, of this journey, and it's kind of going from consultant work and committee work to some extent into your hands, and maybe kicked back to the committee for certain aspects of it. So, I'm stealing their thunder. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dan Toll and Paul Capcara from Parker Advisors. Uh, Ken Russell, the chair of the committee, I think is not well. He might be online, um, but I don't Great. think he's here. Great. I will so. move out of the way and hit the lights again. Great. Oh no, leave the lights on. That's okay, Jack. Please, thanks. Yeah, and we don't want it. We want to. We want to see if anybody's falling asleep too. If people, can, if people can see, then the reason we do it. People with graphics, but if there's a point at which he, folks can't see, let us know, and we'll dim the lights for them. Yeah. Um, and again, I just want to thank Bill. Uh, one of the great pleasures of this project has actually been getting to know and work closely together with Bill and other officials in the city, um, as well as a lot of our colleagues in um, the nonprofit community, the housing community, and the homelessness tax force. It's been a wonderful thing. Um, I, my name is Paul Capcara. I'm here with Dan Toll. He's, uh, we're both representing Parker Advisors. We're both Montpelier citizens. I'm a homeowner on Berry Street. Dan lives over on First Avenue. And Parker Advisors is a Montpelier-based consulting firm. So 
Uh, we're all here as representatives of the community as well. Um, I do wanna say we're also part of the conspiracy to uh, put you guys into a coma with consultant reports tonight. Um, and acknowledging the toll you've already paid here with that first report, we're gonna take a little bit of an unorthodox approach. Um, we are not going to show you lots and lots of slides um, and further push you into the coma area. We've all been working hard all day, I'm sure. Um, so we're gonna try to hit a couple of key highlights about how we did the process, um, lay out our key recommendations, and then leave lots of time for you all to ask questions or the people online or in the public to ask questions. Um, because we really wanna engage with you and find out what's important to you as part of this. Um, so with that being said, yeah. I'm gonna turn this over to Dan to give you a little bit of background about the process we followed in developing this recommendation and action plan. And then we'll go into some of the specific recommendations. Great, thank you, Paul. And, and thank you, Council, for having us here again to speak to you. And we are delighted to be able to give you the results of the report that we started uh, in October of last year. Um, what I'm gonna do is just give you a very brief overview of the process, as Paul mentioned. We, we started by doing a comprehensive review of, of data, primary, secondary resources, reports, plans relating to homelessness, uh, housing insecurity, such as people, people who are in, in hotels or, or couch surfing, uh, affordable housing and housing in general. Um, then the most labor intensive part of the project was meeting with stakeholders. We met with over, over 75 individual stakeholders, including over a dozen uh, people who, who are currently experiencing homelessness, uh, housing and mental health and social services agencies, uh, city officials, first responders, faith community members and business owners. Uh, we also participated in over 40 meetings of housing and homeless uh, associations and entities such as the Washington County Action Team, uh, the Vermont Coalition to End Homelessness and the Vermont Association of Affordable Housing. Um, and then lastly, we used multiple method, methods in, in our stakeholder gatherings, both in person and Zoom, doing listening sessions with the multiple listening sessions with the community, as well as with business owners, downtown business owners, uh, and doing panel discussions and presentation. And then finally, you know, beyond the sp scope of our project, we also supported the homelessness task force around some initiatives, uh, the winter over, over, overflow sh shelter, the, the uh, common gathering space, and also helped uh, in, in the beginning, helped facilitate communication and collaboration between the task force and the housing committee. Paul? Okay. I'm gonna cut right to the chase here to some of our key recommendations, and then we're gonna open it up for questions. Um, you all have a very detailed report in front of you. Um, we did try to uh, provide an executive summary for those of you who maybe aren't uh, looking forward to 30 pages of reading in your free time. But um, I'll just say uh, the first recommendation, which became apparent as we worked with people, um, we heard over and over again that really, if this problem is to stabilize and improve in the future in Montpelier, um, we need a plan for how we're going to create more housing in general, um, as well as more affordable housing as part of that. Um, so it became pretty apparent that uh, one of the pieces that's currently missing, one of the unmet needs, um, is a master housing plan for the city, which takes into account what, what is the housing mix we need going forward and how are we gonna create that in the future? Um, and part of that plan, definitely needs to prioritize affordable housing. The one, the one piece we heard um, and the data we gathered supports, which you'll see in the report, um, is it's becoming increasingly difficult for um, working class, low income people to afford housing in Montpelier. And that's no, I'm sure no surprise to any of you. Um, it dovetails nicely with what the previous consultant was talking about in housing creation. Um, and there are a number of projects in the pipeline and being discussed which would create some affordable housing in addition to other types of housing in the community. And one of the things we heard from many of the stakeholders are in the past, there were often many barriers to completions of those projects. So as part of the master housing plan, um, we wanted to make sure there was a special focus in on how do we identify barriers to project completion and how can city council and other entities seek to remove those barriers to ensure that projects that are talked about actually get realized and we, we create some real um, new housing. 
Um, so uh, we looked back at the previous uh, master plan for the city, which was done quite some time ago. Um, it serves as a very nice blueprint for what we might be able to do and update. But again, uh, times change and there's uh, you know, new, new needs and new focuses. And certainly the housing market has changed quite a bit since then. Um, so, you know, we feel it's important that a new master housing plan be developed, especially because there's a lot of fragmentation that's going on right now. We talked to a lot of people involved in sort of standalone individual projects, um, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of coordination in terms of citywide, um, you know, what's our goals for what type of housing we want to create, how can we create it, and how can we also use existing housing stock uh, to provide some additional <coughs> housing opportunities for people in the community. So that's our first recommendation. I'm going to, we're going to go through all three of our major recommendations and then open it up for questions at that point. Um, so the second major recommendation is to create a housing hub um, in Montpelier that would really serve two purposes. Um, one purpose is to provide a place for the uh, winter overflow shelter. I don't know if you're all familiar, um, but in past years, Montpelier has been sponsoring an emergency winter overflow shelter. It's been in several locations in the past. It's been in different churches in town. Um, we've been told going forward that the past church locations are not um, available for us to use in coming years. Um, and one of the inefficiencies in the past has been each year there's been sort of a scramble in order to get that organized to make the space appropriate for the use for emergency overnight shelter. Um, and uh, it's almost like we're reinventing the wheel every year as we're trying to put that together. So one of our goals in proposing a housing hub is really to have a permanent space that can be used for that purpose. Um, and really the goal is to provide emergency housing to folks who otherwise in the winter might not have anywhere to sleep. So we're really literally trying to keep people from freezing to death. The second piece of the proposal in creating a housing hub is also then to have a place where social service providers and others can engage with those folks in order to provide them support in order to hook them into the services and resources that might help them transition from being acutely unhoused into affordable or more permanent housing situations. So really not just treating it as a Band-Aid as we've maybe in the past have been forced to do because we're providing an emergency overflow in a church basement and there's not been uh, as many opportunities to have supportive services present. But in this case, it would be a place where there could be uh, supportive services, social workers, street outreach workers who can help hook people into housing opportunities going forward. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to talk about our third recommendation. Great, thank you, Paul. So our third major recommendation is implementing a public education plan. And what this is, is the city uh, with, uh, um, under the supervision of the homelessness task force would create and implement a systematic publication, public education plan to that among other benefits would increase awareness about homelessness and housing issues. And then secondly, help reduce stigma around homelessness. More specifically, the plan would help build support and momentum around not only these recommendations, but other uh, related housing and homeless issues here in Montpelier and Washington County, help build understanding, empathy, and knowledge, uh, break down stigma and discrimination, encourage volunteering in this arena, and then uh, lastly, address inequities of the marginalized communities, such as BIPOC and LBGTQ plus in the context of housing. Um, <coughs> we envision a multifaceted plan and among other elements, uh, I just wanna talk about two major components that we're recommending be part of this. The first is a homelessness peer council. And this would be a formal council of six to nine individuals who are either currently unhoused or have been unhoused in the past, uh, what we call homeless peers. Um, the major tasks of this, there's a number of different directions that, that, that the uh, council could go and it would be up to them once they're formed to, to really form their charter and, 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 and chart their own direction. But we see that the, at least two of the major tasks being advising the, the homeless task force, the housing, the housing committee, the city council, of course, 
as well as other service providers in the communities um, who are you know intersect with with issues that they're working on. And then secondly, to be involved in community outreach and public and legislative uh, relations. Um, one of the key things that that uh, that we see this council doing is bringing the voice of people with lived experience, not just as a token, uh, you know, uh, a little few token comments, but uh, involved in every stage of the process of, of some of the major initiatives, major things that are going on that affect them. Second, the, the second um, big component that I wanna talk about is developing a, a systemic program of community outreach and, and, and education. And the purpose would be to normalize, to, to start to, to normalize homelessness uh, and, and the folks who are, who are, are uh, people who are currently experiencing homeless in, in the community, to educate the public, not only about homelessness, housing insecurity and affordable housing, but also about the critical housing issues that are faced by all of us here in Montpelier in Washington County. Uh, Another purpose would be to would be to create a communications plan, and that would address the unique characteristics and the unique uh, housing service needs of the different subgroup, uh, including the homeless, the the housing insecure, as well as uh, people like myself over sixty that are looking to downsize, growing families, and workers who are looking either to to uh, to maintain their housing or move to the community. And, and get involved uh, as residents and as workers in our community. Uh, and then lastly, under this idea of the community outreach and education, it would be an opportunity for the community to interact in positive ways, uh, you know, to cultivate a real and balanced view of homelessness while dispelling stereotypes and biases. Um, for example, the homeless uh, people who have experienced homelessness are no more likely to be dangerous or violent than any of the rest of the community and often are blamed for acts done by, by folks who are not homeless. And then uh, lastly, uh, opportunities for positive interactions would be expanding volunteer experiences like, like, like we have this, the wonderful crew that's working at um, in the winter over, overnight shelter at Christchurch. It's been a tremendous experience. We've gotten some really good feedback from the volunteers about what they've learning and, and, um, and that, whole, that whole experience of, of being part of the volunteer corps and, and, and addressing this, this homeless need. So, uh, so in conclusion, when this entire, this entire public, uh, public education plan, this entire recommendation three is implemented, It'll not only address misconceptions and biases, but also build connections and enhance this wonderful city of Montpelier. Thank you. Okay, hey, that's the exciting part of the presentation. None of our recommendations actually require any new allocation of funds from city council. So I'm just going to lay that out there right now because I've noticed that seems to be an item that comes up a lot. Um, I've heard a few rumors of people saying like we're asking for millions of dollars to deal with this issue. We're actually not. Um, we're proposing that you use the money that was already allocated um, through the ARPA funding um, to, um, you know, to uh, implement these recommendations. So just wanted to get that out there right away. Not asking you for five or $6 million to deal with this issue in Montpelier. Um, definitely recommending we use the already allocated funds. So at that, at this point, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, we really did want to leave the bulk of the time for you folks to be able to ask questions, um, you know, debate issues, get more information if you need it. There's quite a bit of information in the report itself, and we just didn't want to rehash all that and, again, cause everybody to slip into a coma and die. That would be not good. Yeah, Bill. I'll tell you that we were so um, excited about your first recommendation that we actually started a housing master plan about a year ago. <laughs> so um, we were, you know, anticipating that recommendation. So it, all kidding aside, the, the yeah. planning department is actively involved in updating the city's master plan. It's now called city plan. And um, so I spoke with the planning director today. They're very active. Uh, so the new housing plan, this council should be getting it this summer. 
they've looked at the your recommendations. And I think they may even have some some more that would be, I think, helpful to what you're doing. So that one is already actively underway and near completion, I think, or relatively near completion. See, I just want to point out some people complain about Bill, but that's proactive right yeah, there. He's yeah. already a year ahead in implementing our <laughs> yeah. first recommendation. Uh, so so I just, just wanted to let people know that 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 part of it is already underway. Okay, thank you. This is an unusually uh, crisp and snappy presentation, and uh, I'll express my appreciation for that. Um, In part because this is about my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> so, council members, do we have any questions? Lauren. Um, one first one. So really intrigued by the housing hub recommendation. Um, I know I've talked to a lot of people who've been involved through the years with like setting up the annual scramble. And um, so love the idea of pursuing this. I'm just curious, is this, um, are, are there models from other Vermont communities? Can you just speak a little to like how this is working elsewhere and what we've learned from other communities experiences? Yes, thank you very much for that question. So uh, in my previous life, I actually ran the homeless shelter in Brattleboro for many years um, before I moved to Montpelier. Um, and so I do have quite a bit of experience um, with a model used there called the drop-in center in Brattleboro. Um, and really the purpose of the, of the model of a housing hub with a drop-in center and the overnight shelter is really to engage people um, who are experiencing acute issues um, being able to give them something and build some trust with them. So it might be a place where they can get information. They obviously can get in out from the cold overnight. Um, you may have social workers who can connect them to food um, or other resources. In fact, oftentimes there's some level of food distribution that might help you know, happen on site. Um, and it's a really a way to build trust in a relationship so that then you can engage them in getting other supportive services um, to help um, you know, them to move from being homeless to be able to move to a more stable situation. So there is quite a bit of experience with these. Um, in Brattleboro, we eventually merged the uh, drop-in center with the actual uh, organization that ran the homeless shelter. Um, here, obviously, um, the shelter is uh, for this region, for this area, is run by Good Samaritan. Um, and I would say uh, in moving forward with the idea of a housing hub, that would be one group that I think you would want to approach to see would they be interested in integrating that into their system. Because one of the things you really want to do is build a system that has a spectrum of options that meet people where they're at. So for instance, you know, you have what sometimes are colloquially called rough sleepers. They're people who are um, acutely homeless, who are used to sleeping outside, who may not be interested in the moment in engaging in a lot of services, or they've not been successful in living in more structured housing. Um, in fact, many of them maybe have not even made it in the shelter um, like is run in Barry. They then have a system to get those people engaged with the emergency overnight sort of setting, try to move them into the more permanent shelter. And then they have a series of shelters that involve more autonomy um, and more um, um, options for people as they're starting to become more stable and they're improving. Um, and then you would transition them into some kind of affordable um, or supportive housing situation. Um, so really building that kind of infrastructure and that kind of spectrum for folks in Montpelier who are, you know, uh, experiencing housing instability is pretty important. And the bottom rung on that layer is what we're missing right now, which is that sort of permanent home um, where people can get emergency overnight in the winter and where they can go throughout the year to, to connect with supportive services, get some resources, get some support. Yeah. Did that answer? Yeah. That was very helpful. And can you just speak a little to, and apologies if I missed this, um, like is the vision that there would be a contract with someone like Good Samaritan to be staffing it? Like, how are you envisioning the staffing and how that would play out? Yeah, great question. So uh, first of all, uh, it's important to note a lot is going to depend on location. Um, so uh, one of the locations that were raised as a possibility was the existing rec center um, with the idea that that 
function of the rec center may be over time transitioning to the new country club road property. Um, and in talking with the stakeholders, many people felt it was very important for the location to be um, somewhere downtown, somewhere access easily accessible for walking. Um, so if that were to be the location, um, you would then want to implement this in phases. So um, the initial phase when the space was having dual use, just like we've been doing with the churches, would be just the emergency overflow shelter. Um, and then over time, as the rec functions transition out of that building, you would be adding additional services and additional, um, you know, resources for the homeless. Um, how do you staff it if you initially, um, you have two street outreach workers that are currently um, being subsidized through city council? Um, I think you would start by placing them there um, and then a volunteer coordinator to coordinate the overflow shelter. You can then approach so social service providers to see if they're willing maybe one day a week to send somebody from economic services to, you know, for groups to run, um, you know, AA, NA sort of supportive meetings in the facility and basically draw in other social service providers to provide services on site um, without necessarily hiring staff. Um, over time, it may be if the community need requires it, you may actually move to having the need for permanent staff, in which case, I, again, I would think you would want to work together with an organization like um, either Good Samaritan in another way, because they have the expertise and the staffing and the resources to yeah. do that. Yeah, and and not in, uh, not intentionally, but um, but um, we actually uh, uh, something that in retrospect could be looked at as a pilot. There was a uh, something called Homeless Days of Action where uh, at, at, at Hilltop, Econo Lodge, and who's the third? Whatever, the, at the three hotels that, that we have people staying at, that we had a, a, an afternoon that had service providers all coming there and providing services. So the service providers coming to a central location, uh, helping people in Rowan services, answering questions. And uh, we got really good feedback from them from not only the homeless folks that, participate but also the service providers who had this the opportunity to really leverage their time very you know very effectively and, and efficiently and that's one of the the key advantages of creating that housing hub here in montpelier it doesn't uh, no location exists now that's permanent where you can build those kind of approaches um it's tough to ask a social worker to come at you know two in the morning to the church basement um you know in january uh to do that kind of work so this would provide that opportunity to sort of build a foundation and then over time um, be able to flex what's offered to the needs of the community um as you all know we're we're facing a potential housing crisis coming up as people who are currently in the motel program are going to be um basically forced to leave that um, that setting. So I do believe that the problem in the community is about to get more acute when that transition happens. Um, as you also also as you also know, the state legislature right now is looking very carefully at um, how to allocate additional money and resources for housing. So one of the advantages of two of our recommendations, the housing master plan as well as establishing, um, you know, a housing hub will be that it will position Montpelier to be able to access some of those new funds, um, you know, so that we're in a place where we can say, oh, we're setting up this new housing hub. Um, there's new state money available to support that kind of thing. We can incorporate those funds to sort of build out what we're able to offer. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll and also you'll see in our report, one of the one of the secondary recommendations we, we make, it's really more of an inventory of alternative funding sources, which um, we offer to the city, as uh, many of many 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 of those funding sources they're already pursuing. But um, we tried to put together at least a, you know, a decently comprehensive list of of other ways to generate funds. More not not so much for the short term, as Paul said. Um, over the next year or so, we think the the, the funds that are allocated, the four hundred twenty five thousand, for should be be clear for. Um, marginalized communities, I think is the term, but if basically for, for, the, for people who are unhoused and for public bathrooms. And that's the other advantage of this housing hub is it, it would, um, it would, it would oh, one of the components of this would be um, 
uh, structuring it so that there's a, a public restroom piece that, that people could use, and there would be staffing and so forth to help monitor and oversee the activities there. Thanks. Ellen? Thank you for your hard work and presentation. And I just saw that, uh, if I'm not wrong, I counted 72 people participated to uh, make this report. So it is very important to appreciate their effort too. And too many of them were homeless uh, individuals. So when you talk to them, what was their number one choice among your recommendations? We are talking about the housing hub, but did they mention anything else? And also what was their number one problem that we could help with? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So unlike your previous presentation, um, we weren't presenting to this people this to people as choose among these things. We were really listening to people to try to see um, what they saw as an unmet need in the community um, and what um, you know what could be done in order to um, help meet those needs. So to answer your question, we heard repeatedly we need more affordable housing. Um, in Montpelier. So that was what dr drove the sort of housing master plan idea. Um, there are a lot of people that are um, maybe not yet homeless or unhoused, but they're right on the verge of that. Um, and they're finding it harder and harder to find affordable housing in Montpelier. So we that was a recurring theme that we heard. Yeah. Um, a second thing that we heard from the people who are currently unhoused is we need a place to go um, where we can, number one, know that we're safe, um, you know, we have an environment where we can be safe, where we can get support, where we can learn about resources. Um, we heard repeatedly that right now we have a lot, uh, our system is very fragmented with a lot of silos. So for instance, um, if you want to know um, how can I get, um, you know, support around nutrition or food, um, or you want to know um, how can I get help, um, you know, finding affordable housing, or if you want to know um, how do I find job support or how do I get, um, you know, help with substance abuse issues and counseling? All of those things live in different organizations in different places right now. I mean, it re you almost need a full-time navigator to help you figure out how do you piece together all of these pieces and how do you meet their criteria to get the help you need? And it, it really is overwhelming and exhausting. So one of their suggestions was, could you have one place where we could go and we know that the people there have the knowledge and the expertise to help us navigate all of these various systems. Yeah. So that's what created the housing hub recommendation. Yeah, and in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the third recommendation, I, I spoke to, to some of the unhoused folks um, about this, this notion of a, a peer council. And one, I had a, a very long, uh, several long conversations with one of one of the leading uh, homelessness advocates in our community was very excited about this, about this um, this particular uh, concept. Uh, as long as it's set up such that, as I said earlier, that there's real meaningful input and it's not just token, you know, just a token, uh, you know, rubber stamping type of, of input. And then regarding the community outreach component of that plan, um, in, in a recent uh, the Washington County Action Team. Um, or uh, a committee that I mentioned, which is comprised of the head of Downstreet, uh, the head of uh, Capstone, among uh, the head of Washington County Mental Health. One of the big themes of, of a recent meeting was the fact that that as a as a community, we need to be spending more time uh, telling stories about the homeless, appealing, you know, getting people to understand, you know, what these people, who these people are. Um, there's a, you know, I'll just go back up. Um, here's a quote here um, from a, a woman who's uh, Colby Lynch. She and her husband are both working, but they 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 um, it's a combination of of the amount of income they're making and or the the bigger issue is the availability of, availability of housing. So this notion of getting people to understand that many of these folks, um, I was, you know, just to give another example, I was, you know, one of the folks that who I met the first night of the winter overnight shelter is a chef for the Pitcher Inn in, 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 uh, in Waitsfield. If you, those of you are aware, Pitcher Inn's a pretty high end uh, facility. He doesn't have, he, he has a decent income, but again, is unable to find housing. In his case, um, he was focusing on uh, the Mad River Valley, which is you know, similar, you know, uh, cost dynamics and supply dynamics as we have here. 
So I think I saw a follow-up question there. I, I will just say thank you for answering the question. And uh, I agree this idea is great. It is not only a shelter, but it will provide other like social support, right. community support, because I see that most of the people don't have family, any like family support or social support. So it will be yeah. um, good. That's, I just, I want to add that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that. Uh, we also envision that being a place where if you are the person who just moved to the Montpelier area because you took a job as a chef, but didn't realize how challenging it was to actually find housing, that it could also be a place where you could go and there's an active list of these are apartments of, that are available. These are the costs. These are the, you know, so it really could be a, a hub that meets the needs of a broad spectrum of the community, not just the actively unhoused. Um, and that can be part of also addressing the stigma um, of really, you know, we're really all in this together. And, you know, there's not too many of us that are that far away from having a hard time affording our mortgage or our rent or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Um, as a as a homeowner here in Montpelier, I can I can fess up to that challenge at times too. So yeah. Do Any I other think, questions? Do you I think I saw your hand up earlier? Sure. <laughs> uh, yes, Paul, and thank you very much. I, good presentation. A couple of thoughts I've been working through is uh, listen, it um it clearly is a regional issue and it's being dealt with regionally here, you know, with Good Samaritan and Barry and the Twin City on the very on Pillar Road. And it feels like people are moving back and forth. I know there's a large uh group of people who live out behind Price Chopper. There, it's just so I know your scale your scope is Montpelier, but it's obviously as I listen to you, um, it's part of a bigger uh solution or or contribution toward something better. Um so I, I hope that's really the way you looked at it. It sounds like that. Um, yeah, what we don't want to do is create yet another silo, right? So we want to integrate mm -hmm. it, particularly with systems like Good Samaritan is already mm -hmm. set up in the re region. Ideally, the best case scenario is ultimately for people to be able to be in affordable housing independently, right? But to get them from where they're at, um, to there is sometimes a process. Um, and again, you need to engage the folks where they're at and then try to move them through that process to get there. And, and those are the kind of additional supportive opportunities that Good Samaritan provides in this area. Um, and I do think, um, you know, it's also important to recognize that, um, you know, we, we're going to utilize existing service providers to do this. We're not trying to create a new position, a new job, uh, you know, it. when we did the sort of needs assessment, there are a lot of these individual pieces already in place in this community, in this region, right. um, but it's a matter of giving a place where that can come together mm -hmm. um, and we can really make it easy to have one-stop shopping and low barrier to getting the help people need. Yeah, that's part of uh, looking at your chart on page eight with like the, the middle and lack of effective uh, family or social supports. I think other things you mentioned that didn't make the chart, but I think connections for potential employment or helping people get a job with Department of Labor here or whatever. I mean, all those pieces can fit in there. Or if it's a someone that has child care needs and maybe I need help with child care. I mean, it, it feels like all that could fit. Um, Absolutely. Yep. And we did hear that over and over again. You, yeah. It was hard to predict what was the piece that were tipping people into being unhoused. Sometimes their car broke down and they couldn't get to work anymore. Um, you know, sometimes they couldn't afford childcare. Mm. Um, and really, I, I want to address one issue that came up with some folks, and I just want to make it clear. There was this fear that it's sort of the belief, if you build it, they will come, that somehow if we created this housing hub, there would be a flood of homeless people moving here. Um, First of all, <laughs> having run a homeless shelter for many years in the southern part of the state that was right on the border of New Hampshire um, and Massachusetts, we heard that quite a bit. It actually doesn't happen. Um, folks who are moving somewhere to be homeless choose like Arizona or California or somewhere where the weather is a whole lot nicer um, than Vermont, number one. And number two, we're not talking about a program like the motel program that is offering somebody a free place to stay for an indefinite period of time. We're truly talking about replicating the emergency winter overnight shelter and then having also social supports available. But nobody's relocating from another area for the chance to sleep, for instance, in the rec center on a cot, you know, 
night by night. It's just, it, it's not that kind of a situation. So I, I did want to alleviate those concerns. Really, the folks we met with, the folks that we talked to, are largely folks from Montpelier in this area. Um, and they've really, you know, something's gone wrong in their life. Um, they've had family problems. They've had transportation problems. Um, they don't have the education and training to be able to earn enough money as the housing costs have gone up and up here. Um, and that's why the bigger piece of creating more affordable housing is also important. Uh, Donna. I, I appreciate everything being in one place. And, and I like the idea that all your three ideas have been discussed and that you put it here and made it really concrete. Like we dare you not to do it. This is good. But I do have a question about the hub. Now, we looked at the rec building for all sorts of things, even just showers and ADA comes up and you make it sound real simple, just a ramp. I'm not sure it's that simple. I also have an issue with staffing. We talked to Sam and, and another way. They don't have the staffing. We can't even hire people for positions we have money in our budget for. So some of this avoids that. It's like another way's mission is not those who are unhoused. Their mission is mental health. So you sort of gloss over some of that. Help me out. Okay, uh, so great point. So again, uh, a couple of things to keep in mind here. So for instance, uh, you raised another way. They're actually the ones that ste stepped up this year and ran the winter over overflow shelter. So Ken yeah. kept reminding me of their mission. Okay, that's right. I, I got you there. I talked to him a lot. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Uh, so one of the things with the staffing, you raise a point that uh, one of the city officials raised with me is, look, we have this um, police social work position that's open and we can't hire anybody. Again, we're in this model, we're not talking about hiring new people. We're talking about bringing existing people to that location, maybe one day a week, periodically. So it's not uh, new hires, it's not new money. Um, these organizations actually have people well, and you're already subsidizing through city council, people like street outreach workers. Right now they don't have a home. They literally work out of their house. Um, so this actually provides them a location to come to without um, the issue of, oh, do you have to hire somebody new who's right. gonna pay them? Sam said they get back now. Uh, uh, was that Sam. not true? Uh, well, oh, every well, time we would approach them, uh, yeah, the Samaritan. Oh, you're talking about yeah. Good Samaritan. Okay, yeah. so we have worked really closely with Good Samaritan on this. And again, I don't want to speak on their behalf because, again, City Council would be really annoying voice. Question with them? Oh. Mm -hmm. That was. Who knows? Um, but what I want to what I want to say is, having run a homeless shelter, um, it's not the kind of business where you want to say. Oh yeah, I want more business. Like I want to take on some additional, um, some. So I do think, though, it is it is within their mission. They understand the need, and I do think they would make great partners going forward to work out. Yeah. And, and it sounds could like whoever's up. could whoever's uh, doing that please uh, mute themselves. I thought that was maybe Rick turning over in his grave because I was suggesting he could help with this. Is it possible to mute them centrally? Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I, I like. I really like the process that you went through and the and the thoroughness of the report. I at a point when you're talking about the rec center, for example, um, and you mentioned earlier that you weren't asking for any more money. Yeah. Um, assuming that. I mean, you, you do mention it's a, it's a large building. It's got a lot of square footage, could be developed for other uses. Assuming that, that you, you got what you just stated, you know, an, a winter overnight and a, and a place for rotating social services and maybe showers and a restroom, how long would that, how long would that sustain you before you needed to do something like transitional housing, which I think you mentioned? I mean, what's the... What's the timeline yeah. for expanded services? Because there, are, I think there are costs attached to that. Um, yes. So if you're talking specifically about the rec center site, I just want to point out two things. The funds that would be used to make that accessible um, also um, upgrade the facility for the current use for rec uh, at the same time. So um, people now who go to the rec center, it's not accessible to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. So by using those funds in that way, you actually are improving another community service to the point at which then they transition to a new facility in the future, 
maybe up on Country Club Road. Um, at that point, you would be looking for additional money in order to implement some of those more uh, other, some of other those parts of the building, other yeah. parts of the building, yeah. maybe some transitional housing. Um, but you would be going out and seeking grant funding funding for that, right? So it wouldn't be a matter of coming back to city council and saying, oh, now we need another $2 million because we want to create three transitional apartments. It would truly be going out and partnering with people like Downstreet um, right. or other nonprofits and seeking grant support okay. um, because then you have an idea that's actually concrete um, that you can sell to foundations and grants. Yeah. And I spent many, many years doing that. So uh, I can say with some confidence that, you know, the idea of being able to have a one-stop shopping place like this is something that is very attractive to funders and that I do believe you could go out and get supplemental, bring new resources into the community to support that, yeah. not ask city council to support that through tax dollars or right. appropriations. Yeah. And, and not not only, you know, uh, seeking alternative funding for phases two, three, four down the road, um, but also starting to bring in, you know, other other types of partners, you know, private developers, um, or um, there was a presentation um, last week, Becca, uh, our congresswoman, I love saying that, our congresswoman from Vermont, Becca Balin, had a, a session on housing in Barrie, and there was a gentleman um, who owns a business in, in Randolph, Vermont Club, who has bought a congregate facility and renovated it for his employees. So we also have employers, and we know, you know, UVM and Middle Barrier are also doing that same sort of thing. Um, this is like the first step so in a many you see it as an, on, an ongoing process yes. that that would would that lead would, to. Yeah. yeah, that would evolve. But the key piece, again, is I don't believe you can start doing that until the rec center function transitions out of the building, because in the meantime, you're going to be using that facility jointly, which is going to limit which a certain a, amount. Which is a good of, segue to my yeah. next question. Yeah. You you mentioned sort of high level talks with the rec department. Mm -hmm. uh, has there been any detailed discussion about how that would actually work? Because you, you folks are talking about this coming winter, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, step one in our implementation, if you were to choose the rec center for this, would be to sit down with them and do a detailed shared use agreement with them. Um, I will say um, two things. One, we weren't in a position to do that because it would have been a little difficult for us to show up and say, we want to figure out how to share your space with you. But city council hasn't really told us to do that. And we don't own the building. And But when we did talk with them, they were receptive. One of their clear concerns was if you put money into this building and improve it, making it accessible, making other improvements, fixing the roof, we're afraid that city council will make us stay here um, and not and not move us up to the new facility. So I just want to be transparent about that seemed to be their biggest concern They I did not hear strong opposition to the idea that in the winter, um, you all would set up cots and, you know, there would be people in here and then you would get them out you know, in the morning. Because it would be literally a day, a day to day transition from yeah, one right. to the other. Much like we're doing right now in the yeah, church. At Christ church. Exactly. Yeah. Until the point that and they moved working. out of the facility. In the meantime, there would be restrictions on the ways we'd be able to use the facility and develop it, but we'd be no worse off than we've been for the last five years. And we would know that that's the permanent place where this is going to happen. So there'll be a lot of advantages. Yeah. Um, yeah, Christ, Christ church is also... Um, indicated that's probably unlikely that they would want to host it again next year so we're also at pressure um from mm -hmm. not have not being not being able to use the facility that we're using this this this, this winter currently thanks uh terry terry i saw your hand up uh no i'm fine thanks okay Helen. i can't put my hand up because my, my picture is not there but i do have a question uh, and some feedback if, if i may um, wait a minute. Who's speaking? Oh, my name is Ron Merkin. Okay, why don't you hold off? I'm still uh, taking comments and questions from members of the council. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that. It's okay. Palin. Add something. We are talking about winter a lot, and I understand. I live in here. How about summers? Because summers are getting very warm, hot. And some of the days I feel like there's a heat wave, right? And my house is not with AC. It is really, really difficult where I have to put like a ice pack on my hair. So do you have any plan for like yes. very hot summer days? <laughs> so the point at which the housing hub transitioned to also being able to offer drop-in center um, 
you know, possibilities, that's the point at which there'd be a place people could come during the day um, and again, hang out in the cooler setting, get, you know, get water, get other kind of supportive, um, you know, items. I would love to say we could do that right away, um, but the reality is with the money available, uh, that's what, if we wanted to do that, that's when we would be approaching you saying we need $5 million to build a new building in order to do this right away, right? And we purposely um, heard from folks that that approach isn't going to work. You know, we can't turn to the community and say we need $5 million to implement this thing right away, um, that, you know, using the existing resources to build the foundation and then add those as we go, as we're able to attract new resources was really the, the way to go. So eventually, yes, probably not this summer. <laughs> Lauren. Thanks. I was just curious from city staff's perspective, are there barriers to doing this initial step that haven't yet been named? I mean, my memory of the upgrades for ADA accessibility were more like two or $3 million, for example. Just curious, like what, how, are there other things that we should just be aware of that to inform? Yeah, so I, first of all, I, I do like this idea. I want to be clear about that. I don't want to be the person, you know, or the or representing the folks that are throwing a wet blanket on this because I, I do think it has long term legs. And we we had a lot of of talk about this. I think the one of the, the one of the biggest pieces of advice I gave uh, Paul and Dan when I talked to them was make sure that this idea isn't isn't wed to one location. That the the concept could be somewhere. Um, and I believe strongly in the concept. So speaking specifically about the rec, I think first of, so the biggest problem we have is um, the rec has three three issues: handicap or excuse me, ADA accessibility. Um, it does not have sprinklers, so it would require pub, you know, Department of Public Safety approval. Now they have given waivers to the churches the last couple of years, but very begrudgingly and did not see, you know, they they basically told Christchurch not again. Um, and lastly, there's asbestos in the building. We're actually having that uh, assessed right now, uh, how severe that is, in part because of questions that people raised as part of this process of, of you know, what exactly are we dealing with. So those are just real issues, and some of them could have some real financial uh, applications. Um, the, the, the recommendation, the best recommendation for accessibility is, is an elevator. That's not cheap. We're, we're just having our elevator done re redone in here for just about $200,000. I don't know what a brand new elevator in there would be. Um, you know, we've looked at ramping. Um, it, 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 because of the, the slope of those front stairs and the height and, and to meet the ADA standards for ramp, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna guess this, and I know there's people that know a lot more than I do in the room, but as I recall, it has to kind of go all the way around the side of the building. It's a pretty substantial ramp. So I'm not saying these things are insurmountable, but I'm also saying they are definitely um, things that need to be addressed before we could sort of commit to saying this building can accept people. So I just offer that in terms of planning to say, while it would be awesome that we could be in there next winter, there also could be some very real reasons why we can't be. Um, but I think these ideas are all very sound. And of course, we're all making... I think collectively an assumption that the rec department will be moving somewhere at some point. And, you know, personally, hopefully that is the plan, but until we complete all the work we just talked about and the voters approve something, um, there's that. Now the, the shelter piece of it, if assuming the building is usable, um, could, could be a shared use. I do agree with that. So, so just two things in uh, response to that. One is I heard there's this building at 106 State Street that the city was could purchase. That time. would be another great location if you want to go. No asbestos there. No. Um, secondly, uh, one of the issues we had is trying to determine whether this was feasible at the rec center. Um, again, because we don't own the building and because we didn't have guidance from you, we couldn't really ask a contractor to come in and do the quotes. But we did look at existing quotes from previous um, studies that had been done. One did come in at $5 million or $4 million, but that was a really comprehensive bells and whistles transforming the building. There were several that were in the $100,000, $200,000 range um, that we believe that this would be within. And the money that's already allocated for this is 400 and 
20, yeah. It was 425,000, some of that. Went yeah. To you folks. So, so uh, uh, well, there's a little. Yeah. You got a lot left. Um, but half of it went yeah. to you. No. Um, I will. There's still a little over 400,000 left. Yes. And I will say that um, step one in our recommendations, if you were to pursue the rec center location, would obviously be have a contractor come in yeah. and let you know what is the bottom line to create accessibility. Um, and are there asbestos issues um, that would need immediate abatement? I mean, you do have kids in there right now playing basketball every night. So let's hope there's not too serious. I'm actually already doing that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, I'd like to, uh, I see that there are people online who've been waiting to be heard. We have Carolyn Redpath, uh, V. Roden, and then after that, I think we're going to do Ron Merkin. So uh, Carolyn. Oh, Elizabeth Park. Okay, I didn't see her. All right, my name is Carolyn Ridpath, and I'd like to speak in support of the proposal to improve the Barry Street Recreation Center and create a Montpelier housing hub. Like many, I am concerned about what the future holds for us in regard to accommodating people without housing. The 2023 budget adjustment bill will impact those living in motels by limiting eligibility to prioritized groups. The remainder will be exited. Currently, we have 450 folks living in motels and shelters in the Barry, Berlin, Montpelier area, and a large number of them will have to leave. Where are they going to go? The shorter term goals in the Parker Advisors Report are going to be critical in the coming year. They recommend a properly su supervised and maintained place for winter overflow. 24 seven public bathrooms with showers and a location for outreach workers in rotating social service people. Due to funding limitations, the Montpelier Housing Hub will be developed in stages with the first stage making the building accessible, upgrading bathrooms and bringing the building into conformity with city regulations regarding overnight shelter. The recreation department programs would continue until new rec facilities become available. When that happens, then the building can expand its services to be more comprehensive. And I think that that pretty well summarizes my understanding of the Parker Advisors uh, report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, v. Roden, before I call on you, I, I want to just point out that there's been a couple of mentions of uh, the intention that the recreation center will be moved up to Country Club Road property. And I should just point out that is by no means a decision that's been, so uh, that's that's one of the options, but it's not, no decision has been made by by the council to, to do that. Okay, next up, Ms. Rodin. Um, hi, thank you. I'm, my name is Victoria Rodine. I'm, um, I live in Montpelier. I'm a social worker here. I'm also a member of the Homelessness Task Force. Um, I want to appreciate the clarity um, and groundedness of the proposals that have been shared. And I also want to appreciate how welcoming um, and curious council members have been about this. I, I think it's wise um, not to get into the weeds about what, about what, um, what building, if any. I, I know that in both White River Junction and in Brattleboro, um, once the idea was clear about what the community needed, ways were found to find an appropriate building, um, ways were found found to um, fix the appropriate building so that it could be welcoming to um, the people who need support and, and, to the, and to the entire community. And I'm very confident with the kind of positive welcoming approach that the council is showing that we can find a way to do that in Montpelier as well, whatever the building turns out to be. Um, I also, I just wanted to comment on the, as a social worker, um, I, I understand that we have a labor shortage, but with the social, with the social worker that we desperately need to hire in Montpelier, which is the social worker embedded, um, with the police force. As far as I know, the only advertising that has happened for that is that there's announcement at the very, very bottom of everything that's open at Washington County Mental Health. Um, we had a, several social work students from UVM come and visit the Homelessness Task Force a few weeks ago because they're doing um, 
a community inquiry project on the circumstances of um, unhoused people and outreach and street outreach workers. And they're very, very interested in the model here. Um, those are people who, if um, basically, if if energetic outreach were done to fill that position, that position could be filled tomorrow because it's a very, very interesting position. But the word has to get out to um, working social workers and the word has to get out, thank you, to um, students that um, that that position's open and that future positions with the housing hub would be open. I, I'm, I'm sure you would find enthusiastic people who would want to do that work. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I just can I make one comment um, to Tori's in terms of the uh, the staffing issues, and I won't get into detail, but another source of staffing for for um, for this hub are peer support workers, and that dovetails with the uh, the homeless peer council. Okay, thanks, uh, Ron Merkin, and then Elizabeth Parker. Yeah, first I have a question. I wonder if it's possible to estimate among the people who are, are in these uh, these uh, different uh, places, like for instance, the uh, proposed uh, the uh, proposed uh, rec center. Uh, can you estimate how many of those people uh, have the mental problems, or they're alcoholics, or they're sort of chronic? Uh, homeless people, and how many are there because they just cannot find ho housing because it's so expensive today? And and then do you have another question after that, Ron? Well, it, it, it's more of a feedback than a question. Do you want me to go ahead with that already? First? Yes, yes, please do. Okay, sure. I read through your entire paper about, especially about your proposal for the uh, rec center, and there's one paragraph that says some concerns have been raised about the potential impact on seniors utilizing the Mount Pillar Senior Activity Center located just across the street. However, the location provides an opportunity to involve willing seniors in volunteer service activities that would generate goodwill and understanding between the two groups. All I can tell you is that I have spoken with almost all the seniors who live uh, in the senior center and every one of them laughed at that. I'm sorry to say, I think they would have absolutely no interest at all in doing that type of volunteer work. Uh, they're also quite old and they want to be in a place where they can feel secure and, um, and happy, et cetera. Uh, can you still hear me? Something else came up on the screen just now. That's, oh, hello? Okay. We can still, still hear you, Ron. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> But, so I appreciate um, your comment. I think Paul's ready to answer your question now. Yes, thank you. Uh, to answer your first question, again, I, I've spent my career working both um, in the homeless arena, but also in mental health. And I will say one thing is for sure. Um, if you are not encountering mental health problems before you become homeless, you will certainly be encountering them once you are homeless. There is a lot of trauma. Um, there is a lot of stress. Um, it induces things like depression um, when you're unhoused. So I, I think it's safe to say the vast majority of people who are unhoused are experiencing some degree of mental health issues. Um, you pointed out some of the sort of chronic problems that can be there. People can have chronic mental health problems. Um, there are sources of support for that. So part of the of the goal is really how do you engage with those folks? How do you let them know how they can get that support and how do you help stabilize them? Um, but it, it is a truly the community has a range of people. Um, I am uh, familiar with two young people right now in Montpelier, both working, no mental health issues whatsoever, just can't put together enough full-time income in order to be able to afford housing. So um, there really is a range of community people with all kinds of different um, challenges in their lives that are homeless. Um, to your second point, that's truly up to the individuals, whether people want to engage in volunteer activities. Um, I've personally found it very, um, you know, something that adds a lot of meaning to my life. I volunteer with migrant health to help the migrants. I've always worked with the homeless. I mean, I would encourage people to keep an open mind because I do think what people find when they volunteer is that the folks they're helping aren't all that different than them. Um, and it does help address some of the misconceptions they might have about danger. Um, I have I personally has felt as comfortable with a group of homeless people that I have with groups of housed people who might have other issues. So uh, I just think it's an opportunity for people. Thanks, Paul. Um, 
Elizabeth Parker and then Rick DeAngelis. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Parker. I live on Hillside Avenue. I am the senior warden at Christ Church. And I just wanted to clarify that um, I think Christ Church has been very clear that uh, we will not be uh, hosting the overnight shelter next year. Uh, I really uh, appreciate that uh, the work of the Good Samaritan last year and another way this year and all of the wonderful volunteers that have been organized to help with the overnight shelter this year. Um, however, I just want to give a very clear message to city council that we are now at the end of March and uh, we need a solution this year. Uh, and uh, if we were in a position where we could offer basic needs such as a shower and several other issues that we have, you know, it might be different for us, but we really feel that the time has come to offer a long-term viable solution. And uh, I really encourage you to take action, whichever uh, <clears throat> of the two solutions that have been offered or possibly others might evolve, but that this become a priority. So thank you very much. Thanks, okay. Elizabeth. Uh, I'll just take the next comment, uh, uh, Rick. Yeah, hi. Thanks very much, Jack. Uh, Rick DeAngelis, uh, live on Emmons Street in Montpelier, and I'm the co-executive director of the Good Samaritan Haven. And the other uh, co-director, Julie Bond, is, is in the uh, virtual room as well. Uh, first, I want to say how appreciative I am for this report. I, I, I think um, Paul and Dan have done a great job on advancing uh, this discussion. Uh, we support all three of the recommendations, but um, I, I guess the recommendation about the siting of the um, housing hub and the overnight shelter, we do think it needs further development. Um, you know, one thing that hasn't yet been identified is how do you actually pay for the staffing that's going to be needed to operate the overnight shelter? Uh, that's a fairly significant number. And, um, um, and I think Another concern around that that we have is that, um, you know, it's true, anybody can become homeless, but um, many of the folks who are homeless and on the street in Montpelier and uh, who are, let's say, are using the Christ Church this year, um, many of those folks are dealing with some pretty significant challenges, uh, including substance abuse, mental illness. Uh, they might have fallen out of the correctional system and don't have a lot of opportunities in the job market or housing. So um, um, you have to have a program and you have to have a staff that can effectively work with that group of people. And um, so we're very interested in what's been presented. We've been talking a lot about it internally, but uh, we wanna make sure that there's a robust uh, service uh, program as part of it. Um, and uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Morgan. Hello, I'm Morgan Brown, District 3 resident. First off, uh, I want to thank the council for uh, um, hearing this presentation and reviewing the report. And I want to thank uh, both Dan and Paul for not only the report, but um, uh, the presentation. Uh, it was very well done and thoughtful. Um, for those council members that might not know me, uh, I'm a person who had lived uh, unhoused beginning when I was uh, 17, a uh, month shy of my 18th birthday, fleeing severe domestic violence. Um, and then off and on for many years of my adult life. The last go around was 12 years until I finally became housed uh, about 13 and a half years ago. Uh, one, one of the things that's important to know about housing people is it not only takes housing, and then the money and subsidies involved in that, but it takes meaningful 
healthy relationships. And that's what helped me get housed, helped me get housed and stay housed. And I didn't go through a program. <laughs> and, but it might as well have been one. And it, it was much like a housing first model. And I support the housing first model. Uh, Pathways Vermont is really good. And I would like that to be part of the soup because I think that's how we get people from, you know, being out on the streets to be in house. And it doesn't always have to be a program. And that's where street outreach and other people are involved. And it doesn't necessarily take a ton of money. You know, uh, I, got, I got housed with a no strings attached kind of model that, that wasn't a program, you know? And if, if I can be housing, and believe me, if it wasn't for, for all that, I'd be either still on the streets, institutionalized, or dead. And that's a fact. And the thing is, is it can be done. But what it takes is exercising the political will and making things a high enough priority. It's been done elsewhere. It can be done here. We need to, you know, get going on this. Quit talking about it. Quit studying it. And let's do it. You know, and it can be done. So thanks, Morgan. Thank um, you for thank. I just want to finish if I can, Jack, yeah. briefly. Thank you for everybody who's been working on this, and let's do it. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan. There are a couple of people in the room who've been waiting for uh, for a while. Steve Whitaker. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. For those of you who weren't on the council, I believe it was 2019 that I badgered the council to finally create a homelessness task force. And I recommended it not be loaded up with service providers, but people who would then engage and invite the service providers in. They packed it with service providers and nothing got done. So 2019, the charge, I would encourage you to review the charge of that homelessness task force when it was created and compare it to the charge that was given to the consultant three or four years later and realize how little honest intention uh, this body has demonstrated to get here. So. I would question who has the mental health problems, the folks that are forced to live with no access to a bathroom or the folks that sit here and tolerate it year after year after year. The fact that you're proposing a model to leave people outside continually spring, summer and fall even. And, and these congregate shelters in a, you know, in a gymnasium, might not be adequate for many of the folks who are outside. Uh, if there's 450 people in the area, that's com commensurate with the, my, the census I took years ago, before back in 2018, 19, 300 of those may end up being le leaving those hotels. Good Samaritan's new facility on Barry Montpelier Road has 38 beds, okay? There, there's just a real disconnect with what the need is and the emergency is and what we're talking about for solutions you know to to come to to hear from a peer counselor yeah i'm here for you i'm paid by the city to hear for you but i don't have a sleeping bag i don't have a phone for you i don't have a tent for you what good is that you know it's like we're wasting money on false false hope for folks and we're pretending that that's actually beneficial so the cr chronic tolerated emergency is not an emergency, it's negligence, okay? You are negligent in not having addressed this with a plan, with sites identified and vetted for water and sewer and capacity to hold trailers with water, showers and toilets. That's what should have been done years ago. I've been talking to Tim Haney for years about this and y'all just have not given a shit. And you leave everybody to do it in the alleys and do it behind the, you know, under the bridge and on the riverbank. And it's just unconscionable. So 
I already said, why is it okay to leave them out without access to publicly owned bathrooms, which we own in City Hall and in the transit center? We lock them out because it's convenient for us, right? It's convenient for, and it's convenient for you to cut me off, as I know you intend to do. Thank you. Uh, Matt Frothingham. Nat Frothingham, I'm a member of the uh, task force and uh, I live in Montpelier. Um, I've had the good fortune to work with you, Dan, and Paul with you. And um, um, uh, I, I, I feel some skepticism uh, about parts of what we're discussing tonight. Um, it may well be that leaving this meeting, we won't have to uh, ask the council for an appropriation for money. But I can't believe that this problem will be uh, faced and dealt with without spending some money. And some of that money, it seems to me, may well be taxpayers money from Montpelier and I don't think it's I think it's great that there are funding mechanisms there are foundations there are other branches of government uh, other other uh, resources of course exist but I believe the council and our taxpayers here including myself I think we too are a resource and to indicate that uh, we're not going to come back. We're not going to ask for more for money. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I'm skeptical of that claim. Um, we've got whole buildings in town that are eighty percent, ninety percent vacant, and uh, they could house people. They're privately owned. We don't have the mechanisms, I think, to insist uh, that people who own property that could be rented, that they square that property together and get it cleaned up and renovated. I don't believe uh, politically that uh, that's probably a, a possible way to go. However, we can sit down with people. We can gather people together. And we can communicate to them that they're a resource and a valued resource. And I believe we probably could get some action from those people. I guess I'll leave my comments there. A little more realism. A little more realism, I think, would be in order tonight. However much people uh, have given uh, of their intelligence and creativity in addressing what is a complicated problem. Thank you. Zach, are you yeah. moving up the mic? Okay. Zach Hughes, a member of the task force and I do a lot of community outreach in the area. Um, so I did take the moment to, to uh, first of all, I want to say this is the closest thing I've seen to addressing or attempting to go there. I've been here for 30 something years and all I've heard is, oh, we're not going to do that here. They can be in Burlington, they can be in Barrie, but if they're here, we don't have anything for them. This is a start. I know there are many, there were a few in the, you know, who's, who want to mark up this report. That's fine, but this is a starting point. Let's not mark it up and say this. If y'all thought this was going to be the final all, no way. This is a starting point. And it's the best starting point I've seen. Now, I took a few minutes or good half an hour to read the report and I identified some interesting 
aspects. One of them is bathrooms. It's not acceptable to have the police department be the only alternative. Do you know how many people aren't going to go in there? They're, they just won't. It's their choice. It's due to trauma. I want to push the Portland Loop, and I'm going to keep pushing that. It's going to cost money. City staff today kind of said, well, but this and that. We need to do it. We need to do something. I understand Connor's got his bill. That's great. But we've also identified bathrooms within the city, but that's not going to be enough. Yeah, we're going to have to invest. The second thing is lighting. Lighting was identified in the report. Yeah, I would love to bring lighting up because there's plenty of dark areas in the city. I'd like to know why that is. And then I want to talk about the third aspect, long term. The city will have to invest. I agree with Nat. It won't be just funding, uh, but, the, you know, other sources. City will have to step up. Now, the other aspect, long term, so don't worry about it tonight. But Montpelier is going to have to face the idea of possibly opening a shelter here year round. And I'm tired of hearing that can't be done. It won't be done. That this is a starting point. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Ken Russell. Oh, uh, hi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Ken Russell. I live in the so far east of Montpelier. I'm in the next town over east Montpelier. But thank you for letting me be here. I do spend most of my working hours in Montpelier. Um, really grateful. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Homelessness Task Force. Really grateful for Paul and Dan for putting for their hard work and putting this together. Um, it definitely provides a, a good, solid framework for carrying the conversation forward. Um, like others, really appreciate the openness to count this new council to this conversation. I will agree with Nat that we need some realism. And as others have expressed a sense of urgency, um, uh, winter's coming soon. Um, uh, my board has said we're not going to do what we did this year, next year. Christchurch is not going to do what they're doing next year. Um, the two possible locations mentioned in the report could both be dead in the water for different reasons. So um, we need to muster the collective will as a community to 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 figure th these these tough problems out. Um, and so um, and it is good as as Paul mentioned. You know the report is is envisions the housing hub as not married to a specific site, um, but it does to me represent a, a collective commitment on the part of the city. And that's all of us, the, the people here to take this on. And, and I, and I think it's important to think of this problem. I mean, it's a very complex problem. It's important to be able to draw down resources from the state and from the feds. It's also important to think about this as we're in, we're in a community that we share together and we need to problem solve from the ground up and look at folks as our neighbors who, and how do we share space and how do we consider the common good here. So um, it's impossible to underestimate how strongly we need to galvanize ourselves. Um, and there, this is a hugely challenging problem. Um, and it's, and I see Donna with a one minute sign. It's very nicely done, Donna. Did you do that? I like, like the good handwriting. So anyway, I'll save some time, but but really thank you for, oh, well, about it, the last thing is, is, is housing, 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 and you know, it's the housing economics and under the supply and demand curve of housing is just getting worse. The next rungs up on the ladder are going to get harder and harder to reach. So it this is this isn't easy. So thanks for everybody's work. Over. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Peter Kelman. Uh, thanks, Jack. Uh, uh, I'm Peter Kelman, Mountain View uh, Street, Montpelier. I'm a member of the Mount of the Homelessness Task Force. I was a member of the Housing Task Force when it existed, and um, I am the coordinator of volunteers for the uh, Overflow Shelter this year. And I was the coordinator uh, for the uh, Homelessness Days of Action. So, uh, 
I'm pretty, I've been pretty involved in all this. I believe that the three major initiatives proposed in this study would, if well implemented, go a very long way toward addressing the needs and challenges faced by maybe 95% of the people in our area currently facing housing insecurity, primarily those who the report refers to as being episodically or acutely unhoused, not chronically. Uh, chronically, uh, there's very little in this report that uh, is really addressing them. And it's something which is uh, uh, troubling because they are the most visible uh, um, a part of the iceberg of homelessness. They are the ones that Ron Merkin uh, was referring to that he's worried about. So we've got to really think about that more clearly. Look, we need all of these. We need a housing plan. Bill says a housing plan will be ready this summer. I'm pretty familiar with the development of that housing plan as part of the entire uh, city plan. It, there's a chapter on housing. I've, I've read the drafts of it. It doesn't really say very much about homelessness. It doesn't really, it talks about low income, but uh, I, the people working on it are not experts in this area. They need to be, they need to bring in some of the people that Paul and Dan have worked with. As far as the hub is concerned, uh, you know, Bill raises these, these questions. He's raised them all along. How's it going to be funded? Rick raises it too. How's it going to be funded? How's it going to be staffed? How's it going to be managed? Where's it going to be located? We could ask those questions again and again and again. And the only thing that we'll get out of it is we won't do it. I think Carolyn and um, uh, uh, Nat raised the point. Very important. Uh, you know, on July 1, in our area, there are going to be easily 450 people who were in the motels we're not going to be in the motels. Where will they go? We have to act. We can't just keep studying this, writing reports. And by the way, Steve Whitaker is correct. In the first preliminary report that the Housing Task Force put together in November, delivered to the City Council in 2019, almost everything that is in this report was identified as a need. But it hasn't happened. And I told Paul and and and, and uh, Dan, the first thing you have to figure out is why hasn't this happened? What is the what are the barriers in our town that have prevented the obvious? These three these three recommendations are obvious and prevent presented it from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um so there we are. Um we heard a lot i am mindful of the time i know that bill we city staff has Jack, gotten this excuse me i think there may be one more comment a question from uh the zoom land mary mary do you have a question i'm not okay mary uh if that's you i you're muted is that working now yes yes um while I can uh, support the hard work that went into this report and the need for education and a hub and of course housing, I still think uh, similar to what Nat was referring to, we will need a more immediate housing. People can go to a hub, they can get resources, they can learn things, but they still might not have housing because there isn't really enough. I still think pallet company sheltered housing units can be an interim thing that <clears throat> most of our larger cities are going to need to have. There's uh, 14 states right now that have been using the pallet shelter hub systems. And no matter if we have a hub education, I think we're still going to need that. The world is in a housing crisis. America's in a housing crisis, homelessness is extreme. And I think we're still gonna need that little in-between part that can be utilized with pallet shelters. So I support um, the work here and the ideas, but I still think a step between permanent housing and homelessness, we need that step. And I think that's the pallet shelters. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, excuse me, just a second. Mary, what was your last name? Wait a minute, who's speaking? Oh, this is John, I'm sorry. Okay. I just didn't Mary, catch a last name for the last speaker. Mary, is that Mary Messier? Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, Bill, um, you indicated that 
you're going to. I uh, just, yeah, quickly in summation, I, I appreciate everybody's time. I think you have a little better appreciation for how challenging this work was for us to develop. Uh, we spent many, many hours with many of these people um, fielding ideas. I do want to point out something that's been said repeatedly by several speakers, maybe in different contexts, which is um, we need to move forward. Um, and I think one of the virtues of the proposal for a location like the rec center is it's somewhere that's feasible to move forward quickly. Um, if there's somebody in town that has an empty building they wanna to give to the city, <laughs> uh, or if there's somebody in town with $5 million they would like to donate to this effort, I think we could take a lot of other approaches, um, but I just want everybody to keep in mind, um, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good in terms of making some forward progress on this issue. Um, and I do think there's viable ways at least to explore can the rec center work? It does also, I want to point out to everyone, have a very nice suite of bathrooms and showers on the first floor with an outside entrance that could also be the solution to our um, bathroom problem. So I just Great. want to throw that out there. There, There is no perfect answer, clearly. Great points. Um, Council, we're obviously not making a decision tonight. The question is, when do you think you can be prepared to have a well, I, I more think, discussion? So, first of all, great conversation. Um, we also have our team here. We'll be taking a lot of notes. I think we will do what we can, uh, kind of like the last conversation. I don't know if it'll be detailed, but to at least come up with with a, a real clear path of what it would take to to use the rec center, what what the state might require, what those costs would be, uh, and at least get an inventory of how we would tackle that. Um, we have a pretty, you know, we know what the needs are. I think it's the, it's the cost and what what that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think the the Portland Loop that Zach mentioned is something we've been looking at, and uh, Burlington has one. We've been in, in contact with them. I think it, a lot of this comes down to, and again, it comes. To, it, it's not as so much the initial investment; it's the ongoing costs. So, you know, Burlington has one in City Hall Park. It's generally been successful. They check it and clean it and maintain it four to five times per day. They have a staff person that that's what they do, and so you know, it's we can put it up. But if it's a mess, if it's dangerous, if it, you know, so so the question is, how do we support that? I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. There's, it's that's a key piece of it. And um, the pallet shelters are something we also spent a fair amount of time on. And again, not opposed to that at all. Uh, finding a location that is relatively flat, has water and sewer, very important. And most importantly of all, and this is what held Burlington up for over a year with pallet shelters is that the company that sells them will not sell them to you because unless there is unless there is an associated um service provider who is helping manage the site because they know these are these can be problems and so uh, i took you know burlington had the order for the, the places they had the location they did not have it took them a year to find someone who would manage you know and, and by and i'm not talking about a property manager i'm talking a social service manager who can help deal with the folks that are in there that need issues and, and, you know, kind of like a, a shelter person deal with the folks that are struggling. Um, so given, you know, given what we found, just trying to staff shelters, again, I'm not trying to be the naysayer. I'm trying to say, this is what it actually takes to get this stuff done. And so some of these are not just one-time costs. So if we are, you know, and I think this is where you all need to think if we're really going to take this on, what are we willing to commit and do? and go forward so what we will do is try to give you some feedback about the specifics in the report and come up with some numbers so that you can make uh informed decisions as soon as we can hopefully even by the next meeting at least to have reviewed that so okay thanks let's let's shoot for that yep. um, i think it'd be really important that the council members especially the new ones actually go and walk through the rec building. I think that's really important. It's a different configuration than you may have in your mind. And the other thing is I visited the pilot community in Burlington as it went up and after, and it is really well, well done. And we can look at what their costs were because it's much more beyond just the building and the structure. It's also the services. So please, those are two things I would ask my fellow council members to try to find time to do. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And, and uh, as we wrap up this this uh, contract project, I just want to thank Bill and his staff and and Ken Russell 
for uh, leading the task force and the task force. It's been great to work with. It's uh, really been a privilege, privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, folks. Right, Mr. Mayor. Yes. In the interest of time. I was, I was, my next th thought was going to be, we should look at the agenda and assess where we are because it's 10 o'clock. Well, I know Shana Casper has been on the, the call most of the night to talk about the declaration of inclusion, which should not, I wouldn't imagine, take a long time. Um, I would say that the strategic plan presentation is, is really for your benefit. Uh, Kelly was going to walk us through it so that you all become familiar with what we have. And more importantly, if there were changes, if, you know, if people are on board. So, but it's not necessarily something we have to do tonight. Um, we should do it soon because, you know, it's council policy until it isn't. And so we're going to keep moving forward on all those initiatives. So if this group has major changes, we should know that. But you do have, you have it in your packets, the outline. And, um, you can take a look and if there's serious concerns, you know, at least be, be thinking about that's probably something because we, it is a presentation. It takes, you know, to do it right. We should go through it. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't shortchange that. So we shouldn't do that. To, we that's take what that I'm saying tonight. Yep. Unless you want to, I'm just trying to. No, I, th I think that's a, I was, I was thinking that too, because it, it does take a, it's, there's some meat to that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then we also have code of conduct and the group norms. I don't know that we need to do those tonight. Helen. Code of conduct. We um, listed so many things we could do, right? As a city council, our responsibilities. Uh, if we are not discussing it tonight, is it possible to add like one sentence for public's responsibility? Uh, like using polite, civil, and nice language towards us because we are representing people who vote for us. And when they something to us, I think it also goes all the people who voted for us. So one sentence uh, to show that they have a responsibility too. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want it? Well, I think I think we should go to the... Uh... Declaration of Inclusion Adoption uh, right now, and then we'll see where we are with that. And Shannon Casper, are you the person who's going to be the presenter? Yeah, we ended up not meeting last week. So I know Michael Sherman and Jeremy Beaudry are also on the call. If you guys want to join as well, that'd be great. Um, and then also obviously Lauren and Pellin and any other, and um, and Al is here as well. Hello, Al. Wow, look at that. I didn't see you on the on the calendar, on the, on the, on the Zoom. Um, so those who I don't know, I'm Shana Casper, I share pronouns, I'm the um, chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. We were established in 2018 to support the city council in addressing and shaping the systems, policies, and practices that um, perpetuate the barriers to racial, social, and economic justice in our community. Um, we've gone through a lot of different things over the past few years, including an 18-month-long process with creative discourse on make, having different um, just consultants to help us figure out our strategic plan for what are our priorities to make our city operations more equitable and just. And this has, um, you know, in included a formal initial equity assessment. Um, if any of the new or existing city council or previous city council folks who have stayed on um, want to talk more about that, would love to. Would love to find a time to to connect. Um, but one some of the other things that we've been doing as well is we've we have a pilot project of fifty dollars stipends for city committees. We have a budget equity assessment tool. We've updated the history section of our website. And this next step is um, is is more um, kind of compiling all of those different pieces and putting it into this declaration of inclusion. We recognize that this declaration of inclusion alone does not create the operational, relational, and structural changes that we need and that we want to see happen to um, close some of the belonging gaps that we've seen in our initial equity assessment. But we do think it further develops and articulates our goals for an ongoing equity plan and vision for Montpelier. So we were first alerted to it in alerted to it in December of 2022, um, after many, many times had already adopted it. Um, as of right now, 100 municipalities have adopted the Declaration of Inclusion, which covers over 60% of Vermont's population. 
um, including many of our neighbors. We wanted to wait as a, a social and economic justice advisory committee. We had a decision to wait until after the new city council was seated to, to implement it uh, or to introduce it and wanted to introduce it um, with this new city council and as well before the May week um, of declaration of inclusion kind of celebration. Um, so all the materials are there. We've got the um, the draft declaration of or the, the declaration of inclusion proposal that we wanted to put forward. Um, and maybe we can see if anyone else has anything to say or take any questions or I don't quite know what the next step here would be. Okay, council members. And does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts for? I think it's true. I make a motion that we adopt it. Is there a second? second. second. Any, any discussion from anybody? Much appreciation. I, I was surprised and very impressed that there are so many municipalities in Vermont who have already adopted uh, such a res resolution. 60% uh, of the population of the state I had, had no idea that this was even a movement that was uh, happening, much less that uh, it had taken such, uh, had, had made such progress. So I appreciate your having done this. And Palin. So before being a city councilor, I was part of the SAJAC. So I just want to thank my team members and uh, Lauren was the still is the city council representative so she helped us a lot uh, i think this is a huge improvement for our city i just want to say that how much i appreciate being part of uh say jack thank you thanks uh carrie ac you've got your hand up yes thank you everybody this is great um i really appreciate that you took the time to think about what it should say for montpelier instead of just taking the the stock one that was provided. Um, I think you did a really great job with that. So thank you so much. Um, so the only thing that I wonder about is the very, very last sentence where it says the city of Montpelier has been and will continue to be a place where individuals can live freely and express their opinions. And I noticed that in and every all the rest of it, there's much more aspirational language, which I appreciated a lot because I'm not sure that Montpelier has been this kind of place and will always continue to be. I think we have a commitment to to strive to be that, and that, you know that's a value that we have. But I think I just think there may be some people living in Montpelier right now who would say, I am definitely not free to express myself, and so. I, I wonder if you discuss that and what your thoughts are about that. I don't know if that's, is that to see Jack? Sure. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I maybe will, yeah, call and see if Al or um, Jeremy or, or Michael have anything here to add to? Did, did Michael leave here too? I mean, I think, yeah, just as, you know, as we said, we, we really identified this real, um, yeah, a, a significant gap and a sense of belonging in our community, which is why we want to do this. And I think you're right that the language is maybe a little bit stronger than, you know, as part of our revisions than, than we um, had perhaps initially intended. We do really want to make sure that this gets passed in the next couple of weeks. And so I don't know if that's something that we can line edit here in this call or um bring it back for um consent agenda next week or, or next meeting or what the process would be um to make any of those changes it tends to be pretty tricky to do line editing of this yep. kind of in a meeting donna the verb is changed that we've striven driven for or strive to instead of saying it it, it happened put it in a different tense uh huh. Carrie, would that address your concern? Um. Yeah, something like that would definitely address it. I'm not sure the, the exact way to word it, but the city of Montpelier strives to be a place where individuals can live freely and express their opinions. Striking has been and will continue to be. That sounds great to me. So, somebody is that uh, accepted as a proposed amendment to my motion? Resolution. Yes. Okay. 
All right. Great. Anybody else have anything they want to say before we proceed to a vote? Uh, Lauren. Yeah, just quickly again, um, gratitude to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee who has been working really hard uh, on a lot of projects as Shana mentioned, really encouraged the new counselors to look at the equity assessment because it really identified a whole suite of kind of many year um, ways that the city can continue to improve. Um, and I was really kind of heartened to see in the presentation we had earlier that being a welcoming, inclusive city was something that the community identified as a really high priority um, in that outreach project, which I think just reiterates this, this commitment. And one thing that Al said at one of our CJAC meetings that I just wanted to lift up was, um, you know, passing this is one thing, but the whole idea is the follow through and the action and actually the, the implementation. So just us all, you know, in passing this, I hope we're keeping in mind, it's the, it's the follow through, it's the actions that we will take as a community to actually try to live up to this and implement and take, take steps. So just, just highlighting that. Thanks. Uh, John Odom, before we vote, do you have the language of that uh, amendment for the minutes? Uh, yes, um, but I also am sitting six feet away from the person who suggested it, so I can always get it from her, too, if I'm okay. wrong. Sounds can good. I, well, I've got you. The, I just want to throw in something as a, as a staff. I'm really glad for that change. Um, I was thinking about saying something myself because I immediately thought back to the survey we did where I, where I found out that you know, a quarter of people of color did not feel comfortable in the clerk's office. And that, that hit me hard and it has stuck with me ever since. So the idea of striving is that we have strived to is, is a lot better than we are, because I think it really does depend on, on who you are to make that statement. So just say. All right. I Looking around the room, I think we're ready for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Donna. Could we possibly ask the city clerk to post it in the glass cover with all the other sort of notices, at least for a while? Great. Thanks, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for coming and staying on for so long. It's been interesting. Now, well, I, I suggest we move we move the code of conduct and group norms to a future meeting and try to get through the committee assignments tonight because uh, you know, and it's it's an easier call for me than for a lot of people because. I think my bedtime is later than a lot of people, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but I think it's I'd like to get the committee assignments done uh, as quickly as possible because the sooner we get that done, the sooner people can start going and contributing to the committees they're on. So does that work for everybody? All right, let's go. Now, where were we? Did Bill, do you have, uh, or it is? So where the things were that people volunteered for. I don't know. Oh, so it's on the screen, but not on the paper. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, there we go. I knew we had it. Okay. Yeah, this is very... Small, but let's just go down the list. Um, and I'm going to. Would would it be helpful for people to have this up on the screen, or are you happy with it the way it is? Yeah, Kelly, can we do that that way? If uh, if there are still people online who want to uh, see what we're doing, they can. Uh, see what what's being put up
Oh, but you're not sharing it. Are you? Yeah. And I'm not going to move this time because there's nobody in the room that I who, who's who who's who my head would be blocking. <laughs> It no, oh, she's making it bigger. Okay, first up, we have the uh, ADA Advisory Committee. One of the few committee it meets during the uh, during working hours, and I believe that uh, Jen was on that committee, and she is no longer on the council. Is there someone who wants to be on that? Yeah. All right. Oh, now I see it. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah, I think that's a perfect thing for you. Uh, no. Uh, building code appeals. Sal, you're up again. Who else? Yeah. Okay. Pull it together quickly. Great. Um, Capital Improvement Plan Committee. Um, I'm happy to continue on this one. Great. Carrie, Lauren. Shoved off so new people could come on. The idea is that new counselors get on so they start understanding the index and the pavement and choices that we do. So I still think we should, we should encourage new councilmen. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm I'm not interested in I'm not interested in shoving anyone off who wants to stay though. And I think that's a good point. And and everybody can go anyway. Um, cemetery commission. So so where was the decision? Donna still on? There's somebody uh, No. Oh, but Lauren right. and Carrie. But yep. there should be three. Okay. Tim. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Cemetery Commission. That's that... elected. That's, we don't need that. Oh, right. What's that? Just dying to get in. Transportation Committee of the Regional Planning Commission. I, I, so you want to stay. That. Yep. Okay. Any uh, objections to that? And Terry, you should yell out if you do it because of, oh, there you are. I'm seeing it on screen now. Um, solid waste management. You've already put it right to that. Great. Um, Community Justice Committee. Palin, you indicated you want to do that. CJC. Right. Yeah, I think those are the same thing. Sorry. It's really just one thing. Yeah, it's just there's two columns, two yeah. rows, but it's really only one board of the Justice Center. Yeah. Okay. Um, great. Uh, community fund board. Do we, we have? We have not had a city. Yeah, I didn't think so. No, it's okay. Um, complete streets committee. Have we had? We member? have in the past. We haven't had one of these. Okay. No, no, I hear a lot about it in my in the okay, MTAC. Yep, MTAC. Okay. Anybody want it or just keep going? Um, Conservation Commission. We don't necessarily need someone for that. Okay. Design review, development review, no. Uh, MIAC, Energy Advisory Committee. Sal, you're wanting to be on that? Yeah. And, and Lauren? Uh huh. Stepping back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Harry Sheridan scholarship. Ann Watson said she's one she's willing, if not desirous, of staying on that. So yeah, that's a that's a committee that um you know it's an annual scholarship for a high school kid and um the city has a seat on selecting the committee. So obviously during Ann Watson's 10 years here, being working at the high school, it was a natural that, you know, she knew the kids and she's willing to keep doing it, but she also knows that if somebody else would like to do it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, cause they may not, you know, so she's willing, but not demanding okay. that she do it. That's Everybody happy with that? I, I think so too, yeah. 
So it's a lifetime appointment for her. Yes. <laughs> so her son is in high school. She's I, you know, I think it's a, I don't know how it works. I think it's a one-time thing and they come in and they discuss, you know, I think this is one kids apply for and they just say, you know, it, uh, it's not power to do <laughs> or whatever, you know, I mean, they, I don't, I, you'd have to ask her if you're interested, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure she'd be happy to relinquish it. But she does know the kids are tough. Right. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Uh, Senior Center Advisory Committee or Advisory Council. We have not had a council rep, but if there was someone interested in that, I think that would be a good thing. To, it doesn't have a lot of authority, but it does have a lot of informal authority at mm -hmm. the senior center. They, they wield a lot of opinions. <laughs> There's no shortage of opinions, I've noticed. No. Um, I don't hear any takers for that. Uh-huh. Historic Preservation Commission. Do we have someone that we put on that? We don't have to. Okay. I think when it happened at, at one of the last meetings, we were trying to put all the committees together. So they were all in one place. So mm -hmm. some of them, you know, have council reps in there. Yep. Homelessness um, Task Force, Pellin and Sal. Sounds great. Yes. Great. Yeah. So housing looks committee. Like, looks like the new shelter will be in district too. <laughs> Or, or the opposite. Or the opposite, or it definitely won't be. <laughs> that empty funeral home. Yeah. It's in your district. Um, housing committee. Yeah, sure. I'm sure you know all about that. Uh -huh. Kevin Carey. Great. Investment committee. So that committee meets, I know it's technically not the finance director anymore, but how frequently do they meet? And is the purpose to like oversee and uh, review performance of the city's investments? And their portfolio. And on rare occasion, they'll recommend to uh, get out of a fund and this committee yeah. has to make the decision or review it, okay. Not seeing any takers. Okay. What's the question? Where do you need this the most? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, members, uh, so it would be really helpful to get going to have a member of council on that particular board. I'll have to put the assistant city manager on. So I did that one and then maybe. maybe oh, go for it, Tim. Well, housing housing's a regular thing. Yeah. Right? That's a, like a monthly thing. Okay. This is a meet for okay. 15 minutes at lunch, yeah, right? Or something. I could also do it for the ADA or some of these quarterly. Yeah, this is. Yeah. So they're together. Sold. All right. Yeah. <laughs> right. No. no. Yeah. That There's no good. set meeting for it. It's usually this finance director sends out a thing and says, we need to get together. When can we? Mm -hmm. uh, and then it happened. We're meeting every week, right? <laughs> so are we putting the two of you? Are, are we putting Just two Sal. I, I think, think I heard Sal. Sal. I heard Tim <laughs> withdraw quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Great. Um, Montpelier Live Board, Pellin, great. Uh, Montpelier Foundation, Tim. And you're, are you already on that? Yeah. So. Yeah. So would, then you guys would re replace you, right? The, the, didn't we change the Montpelier Foundation that they appoint their own members except for the council rep? Right. So if you're going as the council rep, would they replace you as a... Well, that's something you guys can talk about. It's so, treasurer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd still be on. Yeah, they'll figure that out. That's not our problem. 
<laughs> right. Planning commission is all set. Parks commission rep. Well, we don't actually. Have, I mean, we. Had, well, we have had, and they. Uh, uh, the chair was glad to see me back. Oh, it's a it's a liaison. It's a liaison. Right? liaison. Oh, Person that, that goes. Great. Yeah, I'm you sure. should definitely keep doing that. Thank you. Um, planning commission no, public art commission has not had a council person, but if someone was interested, but it's be. the Wednesday we meet. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, it's a way to keep the meeting short by going there before this one. Uh, recreation advisory board. That that has never had a council rep that I'm aware of. Okay. Restroom committee. Carrie. Great. C. Jack. That's Lauren and Pellin, right? Lauren, you want to keep doing that, don't you? Are potentially interested. Like right now, the schedule doesn't work for me anymore. Um, and I've just been on it for four years without some fresh uh -huh. thinking. I'd be, happy. I'd, 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 be, I'd be happy to do it. Great. Great. And Palin, you want to stay on it? Okay. Oh, okay. 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 So carries. Thank you. Was that a was that a no from Palin? I couldn't hear what you all were saying. She's she's going to the Justice else. Center. Okay. So it's all on you, Carrie. So okay, fine. I got it. I oh. could do it. Okay, great. Sprinkler variants. Can so that doesn't good. really meet any more. Uh, that would fall under the Building Code Appeal Committee. So uh -huh. it's really when somebody, you know, when we had the sprinkler ordinance, people. That's, this group met pretty regularly, people seeking variances, but now that that doesn't exist anymore, I, they don't really meet except once every couple of years if there's something really weird. All right. Um, Stormwater Utility Committee. Currently, Lauren and I are on it, even though it's not listed here. And hmm. we're just about to set the rate, so I would definitely like to continue, and it's fine. Tim also wants to join. I can't see any names. Yeah. Me, but you've got two people there. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to continue, or I could just go for now if you want to keep the official. It's a, it's a big thing. I mean, three, you can have up to three. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's huge. And we've been spending this last year, so we're just about to, to give the council recommendations for rates. So I'd just like to see it through. Great. Okay. In so, so three. Add, so three. Are we adding Tim? Yep. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, MTIG, do you want to stay on that, Donna? I, I really would like to stay on it what is that? it's in transportation infrastructure so it deals with streets roads but also bikes walks pedestrian issues the infrastructure is the committee that developed the uh traffic calming policy main street and berry study scope mm -hmm. uh increasing the shared use path the flashing beacons etc does he conflict with anything I'm doing? No, I don't I think so. No it's, idea. Yeah. Oh, it conflicts with housing. Oh, you're not on housing. Okay. Then then you're I think it's I think you're good. Yeah, why don't I jump on you? And Donna, did you want to stay? Or? I I would. So both of you? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, tree board, do we need to have someone on that? TW would we do. Okay. And we have technically it's the mayor or their designee. <laughs> oh. That's the mayor one. <laughs> so so uh if nobody else volunteers. <laughs> so so the if the mayor happens to be married to someone who has a significant interest in art, that person might be a good designee. Or does it have to be another council member? So the city, so the, the city owns the collection. Okay. It was donated to the city and it is cared for by the T.W. Wood Foundation. We are well, those city-owned paintings. So. Well, I guess we should put me on for now. It's the only committee. Yeah, Some good. mayors have loved being on it. Mayor, Mayor Hooper was very active. Uh, other mayors 
less so. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably more in that towards that <laughs> spectrum, but uh, but we we can put put me on that for the time, for the time present. Needs. Yeah, yeah. Is that great? Is that the list. Hey, can we scroll down farther? Or is that it, Kelly? All right. The other committee that existed was the microtransit, and Connor and I were on that initial yep. committee. My ride has continued, but it's no longer a pilot project. So I'm assuming we're not going to continue. Okay. Okay, good work. Yeah. Now, move to the agenda. I think we're up to other business. Do we talk about the uh, legislation no, under other business? Oh, okay. Sure. So, I have, I, I was going to do this under the manager's report, but there were three. Um, I, I was going to give updates on three issues that are in the legislature right now that affect us. And at least in my view, and based on our policy, uh, really none of them are going the way we would have hoped. Uh, the first is the project based TIF. Uh, which is very important for us, uh, particularly for Country Club Road Project, but even some others. Uh, according to Senator Cummings, it had been in Senate Finance. She told our folks that it had not made it out of crossover. Um, I did contact Representative Casey and asked if there's any way we could put that in in the House. Um, our lobbyist, Maggie Lenz, sent me an email actually during this meeting that she still thinks there's something in the Senate we can get it attached to, that there is some interest in that. So um, that is not looking good, but it's not dead. Uh, very, I, you know, we've already given up our TIF district. Uh, Project-based TIF would be really excellent for lots of things. And so hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, the housing bill, I already sent you the information about that. Um, you know, the the only real change that's happened in, in the designated areas is, you know, going from 10 to 25 units in a designated downtown without needing Act 250. And, you know, for the kind of housing, in my opinion, for the kind of housing that's needed um, in the state, but certainly in our city, even as we talk about these projects, um, you know, we, it, it needs to be more than that. And, uh, you know, the, the proposal really had been to eliminate Act 250 altogether and designated growth centers and designated downtowns. I know, um, Mayor Weinberg is pushing all, all in for Burlington is pushing an alternate whether if you're in a city and you can demonstrate capacity, you can actually take on the Act 250. So the, the regulation doesn't go away, but you can be the state's agent. So it can be done at the local level. Um, that there's something to be said for that, but not doing anything. I mean, they, you know, at this point, the only the only real change in the bill is to tell local governments what zoning they can and can't have. Um, and no real state change. And so obviously with my local government hat. Um, but so we were trying to push on that. And and frankly, I've had some pushback even from our own Senate delegation, including some who may have voted for that policy position. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're working on her. And then lastly, uh, before you go, yeah, I, I had talked to our lobbyists about this and I talked talked to uh, Senator Watson about this and she had questions I didn't really know the answers to. And this is, there's gonna be a, or as of yesterday, there was gonna be a proposed amendment on the floor of the Senate uh, tomorrow. And I'm not sure where things stand, but as I said, I tried talking to Ann and I really didn't know the answers to the questions she was asking. So. Yeah, I reached out to her today, just reminded her how important this was. And, uh, you know, I, I think I think what's happened is there's been this suggestion that there's going to be some big Act 250 reform bill next year, and we'll address that. And, you know, I'm not a politician, I'm not there, but almost every year I've heard that there was going to be an Act 250 reform next year. <laughs> and it seems like it's a it's a carrot that gets dangled. Now, and I know there's important issues. I mean, I know there's there's issue, but I think in terms of the, one of the core things of Active 50 is to try to protect our countrysides and to have development be where it ought to be. And so to try to encourage it in our cities where there's infrastructure and where 
it just seems like this is, should be somewhere where everybody could get on the same page. So I don't, I don't, it's never as easy as it thinks. Lastly, um, and I think this is really concerning, uh, just if I'm, I'll, I'll be testifying tomorrow on this, uh, there is a dispatch bill. And in an abrupt turnaround, the state now seems like they want to take over dispatch for the whole state after saying they were going to get out of the business. And they are creating some new commission, potentially, to oversee dispatch and to study where the dead spots are and all this other stuff. And I think, um, and so there's a lot of concerns, including what they what they define as a regional dispatch. Uh, it's not clear that a municipality with contracted partners counts. Um, they seem to talk about municipal authorities, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of that language is confusing. Straight to the point, way at the back of the bill, it talks about repurposing. It says, first it says all of the unobligated money from last year's 11 million um, in dispatch will be used to help fund this study and all this project. And then later on defines unobligated means includes anything that had been told by joint fiscal aid or approved. So that's our money. So they're taking our two and a half million dollars and re and re reappropriating. Um, so, you know, I don't know what the plan is, but they're obviously not talking about actually taking a highly functional existing dispatch and improving a regional system and putting in the infrastructure. So um, that's not good news. And I, I don't, I, I don't know how this all, it, it came out of Senate GovOps. Uh, and um, I'll just leave. And so anyway, I'm, I'm testifying. So now it's in Senate finance with Senator Cummings. I'm testifying there tomorrow along with Deputy Chief Allsworth from Barry and Carrie McCool, our dispatch supervisor. We'll try to uh, see where we can get with that. It is so far from the allocation language of last year. It just, oh, no, and it's, it, it clearly said it will it is reappropriating. Yeah, and it, it actually says there was a statewide study about dispatch in 20s, whatever. And in, in hindsight, we didn't give this enough time. It's written in the bill. So we're going to redo it. So there's a study committee. There's a new board that's going to be formed, a regulatory board. And the only conclusion I can draw is that they're going to say the state is now. In fact, there's even a pay-in formula. Every time we'll pay in at a certain rate, and then they'll get paid back to dispatch centers. This is serious. They would be turning public uh, dispatch centers into schools and all the money would go to the state right. and then be redistributed back. Exactly. That's exactly right. It's you just, don't want that. No, that's you exactly right. Want that. yep. And uh, and it sounds like this board would be controlling the dispatching. So it'd be a drastic change for us. And, um, and you know, for, for the newer council members, we have a very active project, which we have invested some funds in at the state's encouragement uh, and placed an application and was awarded the grant um, and the legislature approved it last year. And um, in fact, the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the contract you afforded at the last meeting for the follow-up study was related to that because one of the things they wanted asked was to make sure that we could demonstrate the ongoing capacity. And so this was the follow-up study for that. And, um, and so, you know, we were supposed to get in, this would have provided all new towers and radio systems throughout the whole region, not just to Montpelier. It was actually to help the whole central Vermont. This is the total. Yeah. Yeah. Which like six just four total. But that, for this, for that was us. awarded to state projects. Yeah. Um, and 2.4 was for us for this regional dispatch. And, and we're getting it because we were ahead of the other. We, we had a fully designed system. And we were providing regional dispatch, and it would have. And so the, the caveat was by improving the infrastructure. So this all started because the state said, "We state police are not going to provide dispatch anymore. We're done providing free dispatch to towns." In partly because people like us complain that we were getting double charged. We're paying our own dispatch plus we're paying state taxes, so we're paying for everyone else's. So they're like, "We're out of it," and so we want to help provide beef up these regional dispatches so people that are getting left out have a place to go. And we had already done a study, thanks to CVPSA and Donna, 
that had laid out everything we needed. So we went in and they said, oh my God, you're ahead of, you're so far ahead of the rest of the city. And so it was to beef up our infrastructure so we could take on new customers along with Barry, who also has, they have a lot less customers, but the idea was together, we would do this, have separate dispatches, but get all the back, you know, equipment so we could back each other up. The whole, we've been working complete, completely hand in hand with Barry. And, um, you know, I read the bill today and it's just our money is what passed. So that's where that's at. So, so well, yeah, and when, right now it's uh, yeah. dispatch housing and project-based tip. We're in a great room. But it's not over. It's not well, over. We, this, but, but this bill reflects such a split from the state staffing. Yes. The Department of Public Safety commissioner was ready to go with where we were headed. Yeah, no, I totally think... supported it. Now these legislators are off. I don't know if they even, I mean, they had her come in and testify, but after that, they haven't talked to her. No, I know. Yeah, no, the state does not want it because they're having the same problem. They can't find dispatchers. And yeah, it sounds like they're going to be in charge of finding them for every place in the state. Let us do that to our staff, okay? I mean, the way they treat the state staff is just bad. Okay, well, and there's nothing we can do other than oppose it. Right. Right. So I'm just giving you an update on what happens. And I can't hurt. I would certainly, you know, uh, at this point, it's in Senator Cummings uh, committee. So by all means, communicate with her. It did come out of Senator Watson's committee. So I don't know if much she can do, um, but uh, yeah. And it's Work Senate, on the folks in the House. And it's the Senate bill. So let me be in the House. Well, I mean, yeah, when it gets to the house. Yep. Uh, and it's a money bill, so that's why it's going to cross over this week. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So sorry about that. City Council reports. Start on your end of the table. Your time. Okay. Sure. okay, well, Bill told you all that bad news. Uh, Parks Commission it has moved ahead towards their final report. I mentioned last time about dogs. They have established a focus committee to study what trails will be having leash required. However, they did keep the towers and the parking areas, areas that dogs will now be in the future. I think it's July they're going to start, will be asked to be leashed because that's where there was so much conflict happening with people, dogs on and off leash. Uh, the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee that Sal just joined, uh, I wanted to, it's been a while, and Bill probably knows exactly when it happened, but staff got a grant. The committee wanted to, to link the Dog River field with the shared use path. Right now, the shared use path just dead ends out there under the interstate, and we wanted to have a scope done to go to Dog, dog Field, Dog River Field, Rec Field. And so we did get a grant to do that scoping, so that's really important. And, and in fact, I, I was told, um, you may know more about this, but I was told by Kurt that it's a joint proposal with Berlin. And so yes. they're going to be extending it on the yes. Berlin side too. Yes. And go further down. yes. So it's so it's we're doing our part with Dog River. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And again, it's staff. We talked about the idea, but staff acted on it and it's been really good. Um, Carrie? Um, no report tonight. Thanks. So. Uh, no report. Tim. No report, but I know an offer was made um, at some point for tours of different city apartments. And I'd like to take advantage of that. I don't know if any of you are going to want to do it, but maybe we could oh, yeah. do them together. Water treatment plant or whatever. Sure. They're all great. So, yeah. You've done. I, I've, I've been. Tours. Tours? Just to see facilities and understand what's out there. Yep. Yep. We will we'll get that we'll start arranging those and yep. try to get those and yes. Thanks. And everyone gets to if you choose to, you get to slide down the pole at the fire department. There's That's a the video. highlight of the tour. It's uh, there's a video of me on Facebook yes. sliding down the uh, pole. Yep. I may have taken boots spots. I just got to say, my in my tour, I was told no more sliding down the pole. I didn't get to do it. So don't get your hopes up. Would you like, if you like, I will see to it. <laughs> it's okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, that was, that did not come from the top. I can tell you that. Yeah. Probably uh, came from our insurer. 
probably. <laughs> Which is really the top. So. Yeah, uh, Palin. So I visited a uh, police department two weeks ago. It was very nice tour, uh, very detailed. So I just want to thank everyone, including uh, Chief. And I'm planning to do other visits. So if you want to include me, it will be great. And also, I just learned that uh, high school, Montpelier High School will offer three new classes. And one of them is very, very needed. I just want to um, say thank you to them. Uh, the class name is a Healthy Masculinity. Since I have a 14-year-old uh, boy, I said, yeah, that's great. We should start early as, as possible. So I think our educators know what they are doing. So as a parent, I just want to thank to them, considering this kind of courses being offered, uh, being offered at the high school. Thank you. Lauren. No report, but would be, love to be looped in on the tours I've revisit. Another schedule of tours and let everyone know when they are. And obviously, if, if we have to do, we're also happy to do individual ones if they don't work for groups. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's, so you can do group tours and you're also, in, you can do ride alongs with the police department, schedule that. If you want to go out with an officer some night, you can do, they'll let you even stay over at the police fire station if you want, or just stay for an evening, hang out with the crew and see what happens. I think Bob told you the story that Ian Watson stayed three different times and nothing happened and finally went home early one night and five minutes later, they got a call. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's how, that's how it goes. Um, and then the, the water, both the water plant and sewer plant tours are great. They're a good two plus hours each, really, honestly, just so if you want to really get the full detail of them. DPW Garage is great. Um, rec facilities, you may already know, but um, we're happy to do it. And the rec building is certainly worth going through, especially with all these decisions. So, sorry, I'm taking up some of this time. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. Great. Um, I think I do not have, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Congratulations to Montpelier basketball and debate teams. Um, great work. Um, do you have anything else in your, uh, in my manager's report? report? Well, if you are doing congratulations, you should put the U32 hockey team in it because that also includes Montpelier High ah. players. So they also. Okay. <laughs> oh, for the. And. Oh, my gosh. What a is. Is there a report? No pressure. Is there a report from the city clerk tonight? Uh, yeah, just really quickly. Um, it has been suggested that I should just really quickly review the kind of uh, 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 licenses you all vote on. There is a new one, but just, just sort of FYI, a first-class liquor license is to serve, like at a restaurant. A uh, second-class liquor license um, is like pull it out of the cooler, pull it off the shelf, you know, just sell it uh, like that. A third class license is for actual liquor, liquor. Um, it's served, you know, the harder stuff. Uh, tobacco license is obviously a license uh, to sell tobacco. Outdoor consumption permit is obviously allowed to serve outside. And the new one is uh, tobacco replacement, I think is what it's called, which is vapes and such. And um, so the only other thing I would add is I am so tired. My humility circuit has shut down. So I'm going to brag that for the third year, I'm going to be presenting at the world's biggest hacker conference in Las Vegas on election security. So psyched. Vegas, going back to Vegas. <laughs> now you're going to be zooming or going? Oh, I'm going. Excellent. Well, I guess you it's kind of a trade-off. You get the honor of being the thing, but you have to be in Las Vegas to do it. So I know. What a shame. <laughs> okay. Nothing else. We about uh, uh, oh you left. I'm, I'm after sorry. the clerk. I'm sorry. I thought no, so I've just got a couple of minor things. Um, just a reminder, uh actually one major thing and then minor things. One, so we just an FYI, 
You heard it here first. Um, as a result of some of the issues that did come up, we did take a look at um, the asbestos in the rec center. And it appears it may be way worse than we thought it was. So we're getting it evaluated. Um, and so who knows what that's going to mean? It could be either not either an expensive fix or closing the building. So to be determined, but um, the news was not um, sort of business as usual as we thought it might be. And it partly came up because of these conversations we're having and people saying appropriately, you know, I think you even asked, right? Kids are in there. We said, you know, we've been relying on sort of the the word being passed down through the legions. Let's get someone in and look. And so Chris Lumbra, our facilities and sustainability coordinator, got someone to look at it. And now we're doing follow-up testing and evaluation and all that. So more to come. But that could be a, an unexpected uh, gift for us. Mm -hmm. Secondly, just a reminder, I will not physically be here next weekend, next meeting. So dump everything you want on the agenda for next meeting. Kelly will be sitting in the seat. <laughs> so we can load it up. And then the week, the meeting after that, I'll be participating by Zoom. So sorry about that. Just the schedule fell. Um, but thank you for understanding. Okay. That's all I have. And at that point, we can adjourn at 1049 p.m. Thank you all. No, I thought we could strategic plan now.